Welcome to Grux Online. I'm Emma Vario, the director of the event. Thank you for joining us on this second Grux Online event, bigger and better than our first event last year. We can't wait to share these great talks and sessions. This conference is a celebration of game UX and all that it entails. There will be talks on UX design, user research, accessibility, and approachability and diversity. This event is hosted by the IGDA's GRUXIG. The acronym comes from Games Research and User Experience Special Interest Group, and it focuses on user experience in games. I'd like to thank all the volunteers that made this event possible. This would not have happened without them. The event team comprises of myself, Seb, Louise, Lauren, and Raphael, and of course, our wonderful speakers and everyone who submitted a talk are praiseworthy as well. This event is free and accessible. There are captions as well as ASL interpretation for all of the talks. We chose ASL as most of our viewers are in North America, but we do hope that the interpretation benefits people based elsewhere as well. All of that is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Player Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch. The content is divided roughly into two tracks, one for UX design and a second one for user research. Regardless of your title and background, we hope you'll find something interesting on both tracks. The videos will also be available later on our YouTube channel. The tracks are shown three times in a span of 24 hours so everyone in the world can choose the best time to view this today. Of course, there will be YouTube chat for live discussion, but we also have a Discord server for a more permanent asynchronous discussion across all time zones. A channel for each talk will be there for a few weeks, so you can join the discussion with people on other time zones that are watching it at a different time, or if you're watching the talks later, you can join the discussion then as well. The server itself hosts a wonderful community, so you might want to look at other channels there as well if you're interested in game UX design or games user research, accessibility, or any of the other topics you hear about today. We want this to be a safe space for everyone, regardless of background, experience, or other characteristics. So feel free to reach out to our moderators if you see or experience anything that makes you uncomfortable. Now, enjoy Grux Online. I'm looking forward to seeing you among the discussions on YouTube and in the Discord.
join our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. Hi everyone, welcome to this session, I Need More Mana, Cognitive Accessibility Considerations in Digital Card Games. This session is going to introduce some of the concepts around cognitive accessibility in gaming with a focus on how it applies to digital card games as an example, but hopefully there'll be lots to take away and apply to whatever type of game it is that you're working on. My name is Stacey Jenkins, I'm a gaming accessibility advocate and consultant. By day I'm a data goblin, commercial analysis at Sega Europe, where I also run the Disability Employee Network. Uh, and by night I create educational content and game reviews around accessibility, as well as consulting and speaking to studios directly. So first of all, why care about accessibility? So we'll start off with some very general statistics that many of you may have heard before. Uh, one in five working age adults in the world have some kind of disability and the number of people with a disability is increasing according to the World Health Organization. And these figures are likely to be higher due to how we measure disability, people not declaring their disability for a multitude of reasons. The percentage of adults with different disability types in the US, according to the CDC, 13.7% have mobility issues, 10.8% have problems with cognition, 5.9% hearing and 4.6% vision. And again, that's only measuring specific disabilities. That's not going to cover people with undiagnosed conditions or people who struggle with any of those areas for many other reasons. In the UK, it's estimated that people with disabilities and their families have an annual spending power of £274 billion. In the US, it's estimated somewhere around $490 billion. So disabled consumers have a lot of spending power. Disabled gamers want to buy your games. Let's make sure their money is well spent by making games accessible to them. And perhaps a slightly sobering thought, gamers are not getting younger. The average age of a gamer right now is 31 years old. 43% of gamers are aged 35 and above, which is a big old chunk. And the 55 to 64 age group has seen 32% growth since 2018. We are getting older and we are continuing to play video games as we do so. And there are lots of reasons that gaming can become more difficult as we get older. So our eyesight might start to deteriorate, we might get arthritis in our hands, our reflexes might be slower, we might start to forget things and find it more difficult to concentrate. So it's really important that we focus our attention on solving these problems and tackling these barriers for those people too. So moving on to cognitive accessibility, which is the area uh, that I tend to look at, I've got experience in it both personal and professional. At a very basic level, cognition refers to the process of thinking. So this affects things like memory, attention, communication, processing, problem solving and reading. And we need most or all of these skills to play games. So it's something we need to consider very closely. 
And while we might think of cognitive accessibility being for people with conditions like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, actually anyone can have trouble with any one of these skills throughout their life. Uh, and maybe we need to consider temporary impairments too. So you might be on some new medication and it's making you sleepy and forgetful. Maybe you're just really tired and you're having a hard time processing and understanding what a game's asking of you, or you're having trouble concentrating because your neighbors are making noise. There are so many people that can benefit from cognitive accessibility and we want to design for all of them. We want all of these people to be able to get involved and really enjoy playing games. So why digital card games in particular? This is, a, is an especially personal topic for me because it's a genre that got me through some really hard times when I first became disabled while I was going through the whole process of getting a diagnosis. One of the first games that I turned to was a game called Hearthstone, which is shown in the screenshot here of me streaming Hearthstone and drinking lots and lots of tea. I was in a lot of pain, I couldn't sit up for long periods of time, so a game where I had to had time to think and play out my turns instead of relying on my hands to grab a controller and react quickly was really important. And my husband was a huge Magic the Gathering nerd and had tried to get me to play it a few times, but I couldn't remember things and I would easily get very frustrated. Hearthstone, however, gave me reminders, tool tips, I could practice against AI instead of my very skilled husband, which was no fun for me. And as I got more into accessibility and started talking about cognitive accessibility in particular, I kept thinking back and, and thinking how interesting it is to make these games accessible to people with cognitive difficulties when the whole point of the game is to think. So those are the skills that we're relying on. How do we help people overcome these barriers in these games in particular? So I did what any sane person would do and I played every digital card game that I could get my hands on to have a look at these these games and how they fared in terms of cognitive accessibility and also what could be done to improve on them. And I settled on five key considerations for cognitive accessibility. So these ended up being particularly focused on onboarding and learning, which can be super challenging for players with cognitive difficulties, but they're an absolute core part of being able to play these games. And we're focusing on digital card games as an example today, but many of these will apply to other games too. I've tried to make them quite broad. Uh, I, we could talk for a whole day about onboarding alone, but the one thing that interested me about digital card games is that most of them are free to play. So if we don't engage new players and get them starting to feel competent in those first few minutes, they all just put the game down and go play something else. And learning a new game or dipping our toes into a new genre can be really intimidating regardless of cognitive barriers. So when we design for cognitive accessibility, we're making the experience better for players of all abilities, players that are new to the game or new to the genre entirely as well. So the first key consideration for cognitive accessibility is simple, uncluttered UI. And this is gonna really ensure that we limit distractions and help players focus and find what they're looking for. Information that we learn is held in our working memory where it's encoded and then eventually processed and stored in our long-term memory. But the capacity of our working memory is very limited. So when too much information is presented at once, we often lose it. And studies have shown that the more challenging or demanding a task is, the more attention it requires and the more disruptive those distractions are going to be. So when we think about learning something new or complicated, that's going to be a pretty demanding task. The cognitive load is going to be substantial. So we need to try and keep things clean and avoid distractions to ensure that players are going to actually absorb the information we need them to. Distractions are going to overwhelm and frustrate players and stop learning in their tracks. And these things are true for everybody, but especially for anyone with a cognitive disability, those distractions are going to be even more noticeable, even quicker, and the effects are going to be more significant. So... First off, we want to minimize visual noise, which can be tricky, especially with strategy and digital card games. There can be a lot of elements, a lot of different moving parts, but we want to try and keep this to a minimum. So we want to check through each element and assess whether it's actually making a valuable contribution, whether it might be distracting or overwhelming. Um, and remember that players will have vastly different tolerances for this. So make sure to bring players with cognitive disabilities into playtest and get that feedback as early as you can. Second is limit moving or flashing. So we want to make our board interesting and exciting, but too much movement is going to distract players, potentially make them motion sick or trigger migraines. So it's important to at least introduce an option to switch these effects off at the bare minimum. 
we want to try and use really clear signifiers wherever possible. So we want to communicate to the player where or how an action should take place. And signifiers should be perceivable. And that means perceivable to everybody. And in the case of cognitive accessibility, things can be very easily missed. So we want to make sure that they're clear, they've got good contrast, and they draw the player's eye where we want it to go. So that can mean something like a green outline around cards that are available to be played, an arrow so players know exactly what or who the card uh, will affect and in what direction. Uh, in the tutorial stages, it can also be really useful to have something like um, a glowy blue orb, uh, like they have in Magic the Gathering Arena, that gently nudges you in the right direction if you've taken a little while to make your play which can be really useful, uh, especially with games that are quite complicated with their turn structure uh, or there are a number of complex uh, choices that a player can make. And also supporting icons, uh, they can be a really great way of helping players to understand and remember some of the concepts that you're teaching them. Uh, and they should be used alongside the text so players have uh, two ways of receiving that information, which is especially crucial for cognitive accessibility because uh, many of us often need to receive information through multiple channels in order for us to process it. So, you know, I have to watch movies or play games with subtitles on because otherwise the dialogue goes in one ear and out the other. I can't process it without uh, the words to support what I'm hearing. And you want to make sure that they're not too abstract, they're instantly recognisable. Uh, so make sure to test them a bunch, make sure they're intuitive to your players. There's no need to reinvent the wheel with things like this, especially if we want players to understand and absorb the information quickly. It's okay to lean on some pre-existing conventions. So we're going to go through uh, a few examples. So uh, on the left here, we have an example from a game called Monster Train, where you can uh, limit the movement by toggling the static background. Uh, and on the right, we've got Pokemon, which uh, has a simple effect uh, option, so less sparkly distracting effects and things like that. Uh, next up we have Hearthstone, which has a moving board, however uh, it's only if a player interacts with it, so uh, the video shows uh, the player clicking on and breaking some light bulbs and then clicking on the carousel to make the car go round. Um, so it's a fun thing to explore and click on while you're waiting for your opponent to take their turn and it's only moving when the player wants it to. Next up, we've got some uh, really good signifiers here. We've got Legends of Runeterra on the top left, uh, which has uh, some glowy orange arrows in the tutorial, and the areas of the board light up to tell you where a card can be played, uh, which is also in PvP games too, not just the tutorial. Um, on the right is a snapshot from Gwent, the Witcher card game, uh, which has a glowy blue arrow and a, like a targeting, a target. It's just called a target um, for targeting creatures. And then uh, at the bottom, we've got Hearthstone, which has a glowy green outline, which shows the cards that you can afford to play. And here we've just got some really nice examples of some supporting icons. So in the top left, we've got a Magic the Gathering card uh, where the creature has flying and the icon for flying is uh, very obviously a wing. Uh, the icons are one color, they're super readable. Um, and then on the right, we have uh, Legends of Rune Terror, which uh, is showing some cards that have the keywords Fearsome and Challenger. Uh, and these icons are used alongside the words to help reinforce understanding and to help players recognize them more quickly. Next up is clear and readable text. So it's generally recommended to be 28 pixels minimum on a 1080p screen, but naturally this is going to depend where the player is sitting. Uh, lots of players, especially console players, will be at a significant distance away on their sofa, so be sure to test in those scenarios if you can. Uh, go for sans serif fonts wherever possible, so Vedana, Helvetica, even Comic Sans. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that special dyslexia fonts actually increase reading performance, uh, but we do know that things like tight spacing between characters and italics make it more difficult to read, so stay away from those. If you really do want to include a, a fancy font in your game, do try and add a more readable font as an option or try and use that fancy font sparingly. Uh, and the readability group uh, online has a really great study on this that you should definitely look up if you're interested in fonts. Uh, sufficient contrast with background. If players are having to use attentional resources on trying to make out that text on that background, that's going to take their attention away from actually learning and processing. 
a plain background works best, any kind of pattern behind the text is gonna make it really difficult to see, which sounds really straightforward, but I actually came across one really popular card game that did this to my surprise. Uh, we also want to try and use bold and accent colours to highlight the key terms, which is especially important for learning, helping players to pick out the key information and commit it to memory. Uh, and if you have a cognitive disability, it can be even trickier to spot that key information. We also want to try and avoid big paragraphs of text. People either don't want to or might struggle to read. They won't remember what you've said when the time comes to put it to use. And it's boring. Learning can and should be fun. So we've got a few examples here. There's a game uh, on the left that has a card that says Enchanted on it, but the tooltip text for uh, that pops up is not only italicized, which is generally unfavorable, it's also teeny tiny. It's very difficult to read. I have no idea what it says. Um, <laughs> so if you're trying to learn what this card does, uh, what the Enchanted keyword means, you're gonna have problems. Uh, on the left, we've got, top left, we've got a, a screenshot from Monster Train, which, is readable up close, but from further away, the contrast of the font against the background becomes a bit of a problem. Um, particularly the background's got some darker areas where the uh, background against the text would actually be a fail against the web contact accessibility guidelines. And then we also have a screenshot from Legends of Runeterra, which has some instructional text that says, uh, tap to continue but it's very, very, very low contrast and it's quite difficult to see. We don't want players to get stuck in the tutorial because they can't read the text. Um, so those are some things that we want to try and stay away from wherever possible. Um, and here are some examples of some games that have uh, decent bold and accent colors. So on the left, we've got Gwent. Uh, the keywords are bold and in red also. Uh, remembering we might have players that are colorblind, so we're not communicating uh, the keywords only with color, we're using it in conjunction with the bold text. Um, and the main text font is very readable. They've still wanted to include their very stylized font, so they've used it on the card titles only and on the numbers. Um, so it's mostly only there for flavor and not really the most crucial part. The most crucial part is uh, in a, a clear sans serif font, so that's kind of one thing that you can do. And then in the top right, we've got a screenshot from Slay the Spire, which uh, makes use of the color yellow to highlight the keywords. Next up is trying to limit the need for memory. So we know that our working memory is limited, so we want to try and minimize the amount of information that the player needs to remember. Unless, of course, memory recall is part of your core gameplay experience. But if you're not testing the player's memory and you'd rather them focus on their strategy, which cards to play in a given scenario, we should try and take the load off that player whenever we can. So we want to try and give them reminders. In the case of digital card games, this might be tool tips that pop up when you hover over a word to remind yourself what that card actually does when it's played. Uh, maybe it's control reminders that appear in the corner of the screen. We can give them a glossary or some tips that they can refer back to in the menus. Uh, tracking as well. So we want to help the player remember where they've been, what they've done, uh, what they're meant to be doing as much as possible. So this could be on-screen quest tracking or a log that they can refer to in the menu. In the case of card games, this could mean deck tracking. So what cards have we played, which cards have we discarded, and which cards are left in our deck. So these are all really important to, to know and keep track of in order to improve your game. So we really need to consider if we want a player to bear that cognitive load or not. Um, and it's it's quite mixed in digital card games actually. So in, in the case of some, they want to try and replicate the experience of the cardboard equivalent. So they don't want players relying on a digital way of tracking. They want players to use their memory so the experience is comparable on paper. So it's a very interesting debate there. And then error prevention, which I've got some really nice uh, examples for you coming up. So looking at reminders, uh, Hearthstone on the bottom left allows you to hover over a card and it will explain what those keywords mean. So it's showing us the definition of stealth and death rattle. And then top left is Monster Train, which also has some really nice icons next to the keywords. Uh, and this is on hover as well. Uh, so really nice to see there. Uh, with respect to tracking, Hearthstone has a bar on the left hand side of the board, uh, which you can see in the top left. Um, and you can see some of the previous actions taken by yourself and your opponent. You can't see all of them, but you can see up to a certain amount. Um, and then a screenshot from uh, Monster Train again, uh, where you can actually look at your draw pile and your discard pile too. 
Um, but yeah, there's a bit of a divide here. Some games don't have it and players actually end up using third party tools to track their deck. Error prevention is a really interesting one because it's not commonly used, but we're starting to see it here and there. Uh, this example in the top left is from Pokemon, which has a pop-up in the tutorial matches that reminds you if you're about to skip your turn without playing any cards. Um, and then one in uh, Magic the Gathering Arena in the bottom, uh, bottom right, where this kind of error prevention is actually in the PvP matches too. It's not just in the tutorial. Um, and it pops up, for example, when you target your own creature to be sacrificed for no reason, or you buff your opponent's creature, uh, and it doesn't make any sense in context. So the, give, the game will give you a, are you sure? Just in case you've done that by mistake. So that's really cool too. Tutorials that are replayable and self-paced. So obviously structured tutorials aren't necessarily gonna be the right choice for every game. There are a vast number of ways that you can teach the player, but for digital card games and strategy games in particular, it can be really, really powerful. So replayable, um, players with cognitive difficulties might take longer to process and learn things. They might need to repeat an activity a few more times to really retain that information. So we want to, make it available for those players and also players that might come back to your game after taking a break too. We want to let them read and progress at their own pace. We don't want to punish players for needing more time to read and process information. You can also reward players for progressing, which is really important in making them feel more confident and making the learning process fun and rewarding. So that might be uh, rewarding them with card packs, coins, uh, unlocking new characters, that kind of thing. And then also using daily challenges and quests just to guide players towards the tasks that will help them learn and master the game. So um, in Legends of Runeterra on the left and uh, a game called Teppan in on the bottom right, uh, we have some tutorials and challenges that are available at any time. Uh, and then some progression awards, rewards, some really nice ones uh, in Hearthstone playing in practice mode uh, earns you card packs and then you also unlock new cards and new decks to play by challenging those characters in practice mode. And Pokemon here has a classic case of rewarding players with, uh, with points or coins uh, and a card pack if you pass all of the tutorials too. Uh, on the next slide, we have some screenshots from Gwent uh, which has daily quests and contract. So it might say play 10 matches or play a particular class or deck. Uh, MTG Arena also uh, on the bottom there directs you to play uh, blue or red spells, which will help you build an understanding of those colors and how they play out in different situations. And then at the top we have Legends of Runeterra, which have some prologue quests, which are also there to challenge you and direct you to game modes that are gonna help you learn and progress. Lastly, we have practice and unranked modes. So we know that learning is best when it's in context, when players learn by doing and can actually apply their knowledge. So we wanna provide a safe space for players to learn and make mistakes without being punished. So that's especially important for those with cognitive difficulties who might need a little bit more. And practice modes are really great for this. So this will usually be against AI and that will serve as a training ground for players. Um, if it makes sense in the context of the game, uh, these modes should also be untimed so that players can progress at their own pace. Uh, creating training scenarios, so ones that have been created specifically to teach a particular concept or keyword. They might not even be full games. Uh, full games can be quite long and tiresome sometimes, so these bite-sized scenarios are more approachable and people don't have to hold their attention for too long. Uh, and unranked, unranked modes are a really good way uh, of letting players practice and experiment without being punished too much. So they're going to be playing against other players, but they're not going to, you know, drop rank or lose anything by playing in these modes. Um, Hearthstone and Magic the Gathering have these kind of practice modes. Uh, the Magic the Gathering, uh, Magic the Gathering Arena, sorry, has uh, something called the Master the Color Challenges, where you play a series of practice matches using a particular color deck to help you learn those particular concepts and see how that color matches up against the others. So that's really interesting. Um, and then Rune Terra has some really great training scenarios called challenges. So these are the bite-sized chunks or sections of games where you learn a particular concept or keyword. Uh, and then Teppan on the left also has some uh, training scenarios available. And both games have challenges that are recommended for different levels of player too. 
And that's about all I have time for today. I hope you enjoyed my whistle stop tour <laughs> of digital card games and some of the considerations that we need to make when designing for cognitive accessibility. I'll leave you with some resources here if you want to learn more about accessibility uh, and get involved in those conversations. And that's it. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn or find me on Twitter as Stacey of Gotham, where I'll probably be gushing about video games and talking about accessibility. Uh, thank you for watching and have a great conference. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, The Book, How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.
Join our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. Hi everyone, my name is Marianne, welcome to my talk. I am UX designer at Voodoo in the casual team of Berlin. And I have now been working in the mobile game industry for eight years. So I originally started off as a UI UX designer, but my career eventually shifted to UX only. Um, in my career, I had the opportunity to design different genres of game on mobile. And I've always been used to working in pretty small teams and I took care of many different aspects and I really loved having an impact on the overall experience of the game rather than only the art. And so today I am here to talk to you about our game Plantopia. Uh, it's a free to play casual mobile game and this is what we call a merge game. And our game is played 75% uh, by women and the average age is 27 years old. So this game is about Olivia, who finds an abandoned garden. So she starts fixing it up and planting flower, flowers there. And then she starts a little organic project business. And so this game was created with the intention to bring something fresh and modern to the table for players. And that's why we chose to touch on topics such as sustainability, local businesses, uh, building fr friendships, and also helping people. But we also wanted to create an innovative gameplay experience but innovation in uh, this industry can be challenging. So why is innovation in the mobile market particularly a challenge? So first off, um, how much innovation a player will be receptive to may actually uh, vary across different audiences, but also context. So when we are talking about a casual mobile game, uh, players are looking for a specific kind of experience. And our audience in particular, they have a busy life, maybe they have young children, uh, a demanding job and they're looking for something that can really get their minds uh, off of things for a couple of minutes after work or in between breaks. Uh, so in our uh, surveys, uh, it has been shown that the, our players also have a lot of anxiety in their life. So they are specifically looking for an escape and not something that could add more stress in their life. And sometimes they might not even want to learn something new and they might want to stick to something more familiar. And I would say, um, in general, the first time user experience is a very fragile moment for a free to play mo mobile game because mobile game can be played anywhere, anytime. So the player might not be giving 100% uh, of their attention. Uh, they are also more likely to be in an unstable environment. So maybe they are watching Netflix at the same time and they're also getting messages from their friends. And yeah, so we also picked the portrait mode because we. Uh, also cater to players who actually appreciate being able to play with one hand. And finally, um, the player did not pay for the game. So if they are not very convinced by the first minutes, they are less likely to give it a, a chance. So if you want most of the, your players to get into our games, should, they should be able to do so almost mindlessly. Um, you cannot let players getting stuck and having to figure out things out for themselves. Uh, because then a, a good chunk of them will simply give up. And so if you paid to acquire these players, you, you can't really afford that. So that's where innovation can get in the way. So if too much uh, is new to them, uh, it's going to require more focus or time on their end. And they might not be in the right conditions to give that to your game. So with this in mind, we can imagine how hard it is 
to find the right balance between new and familiar to create a success and how to guide them smoothly through the innovative parts. In our goal, uh, in our case, the goal was to make this game usable and enjoyable for an audience as large as possible, even to non-gamers. But first, I wanted to take a minute to introduce you to the merge genre in case you are not familiar with it. So at the moment, it's a trending genre uh, in the mobile market. And the core mechanic is very simple. So the idea is to merge identical resources together uh, in order to make it evolve to a higher level. And this mechanic can apply to any kind of theme. Uh, in our case, we pick plants. So here in the video is an example on how you can merge lemon seeds until you get a lemon tree. And what players like about this type of game is how calming and relaxing it is. They can really use this game uh, to get the minds of things. In most of the recent merge games that came out, there is also no win or lose state. So it's mostly based on completing tasks. So there is also a constant feeling of progression and productivity. And uh, they can also control their session, session time um, because they can stop and they can pick up where they left off at any moment. So there is no time commitment that could potentially create stress or um, reduce the moments where they can play the game. So um, in what ways is Plantopia different and innovative compared to the other merge games? I would say that what makes our game different is because it's a combination of elements that we picked from several different game genres. So we have the merge core mechanic, where, as I said, the player uh, grow plants, and then they have to plant it in the garden and wait until it's ready to be harvested to sell them. So we have a farming uh, metagame similar to Farmville. And we also have some elements inspired from Animal Crossing. So traditionally, most merge games or casual games use an isometric view, but we use a front-facing camera uh, with perspective and on a touch screen, it actually impacts the interactions with the environment. And then we also have a DIY crafting feature, which, which is a, another big point of innovation. Uh, so as you can see, there is a lot going on in this game and combining these elements together meant that we would have to invent new ways to make them work together. So we also wanted to stay away from uh, some frustrating aspects that we saw in uh, other merge games. So first off, we have the energy system, where so completing tasks uh, costs you energy, and so as a player, there is nothing you can do once you are done, uh, except uh, paying. So your se session ends really suddenly, and we wanted our sessions to end more naturally by using different ways. Uh, also in a lot of merge games, uh, the player has a single board to merge with limited space. So the problem is as they discover more and more items, um, there is quickly a space issue. So players have to get rid of resources that may have a high value or may be useful later. So it's frustrating for the player, but also in terms of design, it limits the new content that can be added. So we made these choices, but it would also create some problems that we could not anticipate. So to avoid the space management issue and also have a more scalable system, we decided that there would be, instead of one game board, several game boards where you could find different types of items. So in order to grow plants, uh, the player will have to gather different items across these boards. So to make a sunflower, you need a sunflower sapling from the greenhouse and some lights uh, and gloves in the tool shed. But these uh, design choices that we made uh, meant that just for the basic loop, the player has to go to four different places. They have to check uh, the customer orders in the market. They have to collect the right ing ingredients in the boards, and then they plant in the garden and then return to the market to sell. And as the player progresses further in the game, the DIY crafting is unlocked and it adds another layer of complexity to the game. The new boards are unlocked where you can merge your plants further to create new products. 
So as an example, you can merge your coffee beans to get an espresso, or you can process almonds to get almond milk. And then uh, you can even combine these resources together to get a latte. Um, so when it was designed, uh, we already anticipated that it would be impossible for a player to remember what they're making, like what kind of resources they need, what they are supposed to find all of this, uh, all of this at the same time. So just looking at this chart, uh, you can tell that the game might be heavy on the mental load. To help with this, um, design came up with the idea of pinning a recipe. So you could attach it to the top of the screen directly from an order or from a recipe book, and it will stay here on top uh, no matter where you go, like a current objective, until you are done with the recipe. So the problem is uh, this feature was invented. Uh, there are similar features in apps or in RPGs, but it doesn't exist in other mobile games. So we, ha we would have to teach this to the player from scratch. So the development of Pantopia started in April 2020, and I only joined the team in October, so the, only, the game was already quite advanced. And before I joined, there was nobody dedicated to UX, so there was quite a lot of issues. Uh, and as soon as the team had a prototype, they had been playtesting the first 30 minutes of the game almost every week, but the playtests were um, pretty chaotic, so they did not understand what they were doing, would get stuck for several minutes uh, trying to figure out what they were supposed to do. And when I joined the project, our day one retention was uh, 35%, so the team was really questioning these design choices and the, the variability of this game as a casual game. And the first months of my work on this game are mostly focused on fixing the first time user, user experience, working with an existing tutorial and fixing um, the usability. So yeah, we did many rounds of playtests. We tried very different things to fix it and um, I organized them in, in different types of strategies. So uh, some of them might seem uh, pretty obvious. Some of them are actually mistakes, uh, but I think it's still valuable to share this to you because also show uh, practical examples of best practices that you can find out there. So um, it's no breaking news for UX designers that you should not teach everything at once if you want players to understand and remember how to play the game. But even knowing this, um, when is the right time to introduce something is very subjective, especially when you know very well how the game works, you have your own assumptions on what will be easy or not to understand so even though our features were already uh, introduced progressively, players were still overwhelmed. So we decided to spread uh, the unlocking of our features considerably, and it would take almost double the time to unlock the same features. And this change made, really made a huge difference. So it was visible on the playtest, but most importantly on the data, uh, because on this iteration, our day one retention went from 35% uh, to 50%. I think a good starting point when you are designing a feature unlock is uh, assuming that you are based and that you underestimate how much you should spread these features and eventually, eventually you can adjust later. And so it also applies when we decide to add new features to the game. So most of the time you cannot just squeeze this feature in the middle of things. Uh, you have to reshuffle things. So when I want to introduce a new feature, I always look at playtests and data to find the best possible moment. So I think um, the classic flow model is also very useful um, as a tool to define when the player is in the right state of mind to learn more complexity and welcome new features. So I find this interesting variation with the different emotions that people can feel when they are below or above the flow state. And if you look closely at the player's emotion during playtesting, they can be used as a needle to let you know if a particular feature should maybe arrive earlier or later in the player experience. So when I think when they are leaning towards the security area, it's the best moment because this is when they are mastering things and they are start, start to complete actions faster, more automatically. Um, but I wouldn't introduce it during the flow because this is what we are all aiming for when we are designing games. And I wouldn't also introduce it when it seems like they are getting bored because they might already have churned before. And our game was avail available on the App Store, so we will 
we were able to acquire players and we could always combine this qualitative data uh, that we have with quantitative data to see if they confirm each other. So uh, by simply tracking the steps of our funnels, we could easily see the steps where they, we were losing more players than usual. And of course, we were looking at the moments, uh, which levels they would turn. So, you know, a spike of a player turning uh, when a, a new feature was introduced was a sign that maybe this is too overwhelming. And also uh, an increasing trend of churning could be a sign that they are getting bored. Uh, of course, if we didn't introduce any challenge here. So one of the other changes that had the most significant impact in the success of our tutorial was really to channel the player's attention by removing anything else that can take away their attention from what they are supposed to do. Uh, so as an example, originally our, our, our board uh, would, would display a bunch of uh, locked items. So they would just start interacting with everything as in they didn't really have a clue if they were really going in the right direction. And then we added widths uh, that disappear when you merge next to them. So it would progressively discover uh, what is on the board. So not only was it better to focus the player's attention, uh, it's also a lot more satisfying and it gives a sense of uh, discovery, progression. So hiding the distractions can also be done in a playful manner for the player. So we have been applying uh, this principle to uh, many other aspects of the game. We made a lot of secondary menus uh, hidden and we unlocked them later because even though it was not a complex feature, maybe it could be perceived as one. And also sometimes um, looking at the footage, we were really baffled at how important things were going on the screen and players didn't notice them. So I'm thinking it could be linked to the limitation on visual equity uh, because we didn't really realize that it could be an issue on, on a small phone screen. So uh, one example of that is that how player, even though they had gathered every ingredients they needed to plant, they didn't notice that it could already plant and they would keep merging things on the board that they didn't need. So they could not progress in the game. And uh, it's maybe because they were focused on the middle of the screen and the pin is placed at the top. So one thing that helped were adding a lot more visual effects. So now when the player gets one item that is needed for the current objectives, I'll see a particle go to the top. And once all the items are, are gathered, they have a big celebratory message uh, displayed in the middle. Um, and uh, similarly for the market orders. Um, so our players didn't really react to the customer orders that were ready to be sold. And since it's part of the basic loop, so it was really crucial to make players complete this step. So similarly, we doubled down on the VFX uh, with a really obvious tooltip, uh, floating with the customer space. And interestingly, players it still ignored it uh, until we added a check mark to it. So it shows how even small details can make a big difference and how also a VFX isn't really relevant if you don't really attach a meaning to it. So one of the main problems of our game is about the mental loop. So one of the strategies we tried to alleviate it is implementing some automatic behaviors that would help uh, to remove some of this mental loop. And so if you have played a match-free game on mobile, you might be familiar with this uh, green play button in the bottom right. Uh, it takes you to the gameplay and some merge games use it too. So since our players uh, didn't know what to do in the game, designers decided to use this familiar button that would do the thinking instead of them. So no need to really navigate between buildings, it would take them to the right place immediately. So we have a chart here of how the button would behave depending on the situations. So we tested it and it worked. Uh, people would intuitively tap that button, uh, but the benefit of this button was actually very shallow and confusing for several reasons. Uh, so for some players, as soon as they unlocked another board, it became useless. They didn't know how the button behaved and they started uh, immediately navigating manually. And also um, the lack of control didn't feel good. So it doesn't matter if the button acts in a rational way. It's very important um, to give your players the freedom to be irrational and maybe take the longest route because this is not how they perceive things. 
And also all the players who actually relied on this button, they would no longer know what to do when it, it was required of them to think about where to go because they never really thought about it. So in our case, it was preventing players to understand how the game works. And we actually really needed players to think here. So an automatic behavior might seem like a good idea on paper, but it's actually pretty dangerous. So as a, as a general rule, I would uh, advise against using these automatic behaviors. But I did find one example where it has been useful for us. So when the player pins a recipe, um, they might miss a resource that would require them to pin another recipe. So for example, here on the left, you can see that to create a yellow bag, you need yellow coloring. But it's very tedious to do it manually in the recipe book. So it would cause them to forget about the initial objective. So um, we added a feature uh, where they could pin the missing item directly from that recipe. And uh, once it's completed, the initial re recipe comes back again to the foreground. So when is it really relevant to add an automatic behavior? So I think it's safe to say that it's very risky to have them for anything that impacts the strategy or takes decision for the player. In, it's also not something I would use when the player is really learning the loop and the logic. However, uh, it can make a difference in your player experience if it can help them stay in the flow or stay on track with their objective. But it should only be used in cases where you are sure about your player's uh, intention and if you are sure that this is what they will want to do next. And coming back to the pin, uh, it was a good idea, but the problem is that since it was new, players did not understand the function of the feature. So we did explain it in the tutorial, but as you know, players may not read the text or simply forget, so it wasn't enough. Uh, so I did two things to fix it, and the solutions were also quite simple. So first, I was inspired by puzzle game tutorials, and so I added a, a step where uh, instead of presenting it as something that the player can use, um, I clearly state this as the player's objective. So in this case, uh, taking inspiration from other games has been useful. Um, and I think before that, not only did we not draw enough attention to the objective, I think we tried to make our tutorial blend too much with the storyline for the sake of immersion, meaning that sometimes the actual instructions can become blurry. And despite this, uh, sometimes Players didn't really grasp uh, the concept of pinning, so they would just uh, you know, repeat this word in confusion. Uh, and one was wondering if it had anything to do with Pinterest. So here I, I simply changed the verb from pin to prepare. So instead of describing what this feature does, I replaced it with a practical like, action verb. So there is absolutely no ambiguity you now. Uh, when the player presses this button, they, they make the decision of working on this recipe. Another classic issue that we had with our game is that um, despite explaining everything in the tutorial and making the player successfully complete each step, not all players would have really remembered or have paid attention to the tutorial and they would get lost when they once they had to be independent. So while I think it's a very necessary step, it's useless to extend it. Uh, it's, it would only make the player crazy to have zero control in the game. But Leaving uh, the player without any guidance, it's also not an option. We did have some hints being triggered, but it was not sufficient or it was uh, even frustrating or misleading. So I kind of, ha I kind of had to restart this from, from scratch. So um, I designed a system of hints that would be triggered under certain conditions. Uh, so unsurprisingly, the first condition is the period of inactivity. And then I have a list of priorities to display the hint that is the most relevant or natural to display next um, in relation to the player's current objective. And uh, this system is, is designed to evolve with the player's skill level. So for the first hour of gameplay, uh, everything is active, but the delay will uh, increase. And later it's going to be deactivated. Otherwise players will get very frustrated uh, that the game would not let them think for themselves. Uh, and then what I call uh, passive help, so it's what the player can actively seek. Um, so one of the complexity of our game is that 
has a lot of content. So we have tens of different recipes. We have hundreds of different items. And it can come from different places. So for each required resource, uh, if they don't remember how and where to get it, they can always access this help pop-up where they'll get all the information they need. And I have been able to observe that this pop-up really became a pillar in the game for new players, but also for players who came back uh, after not playing the game for a while. And it's also working because we've made it easy and quickly to access. So uh, if we decided to show this information in a separate menu where they would have to go back constantly, it would have been a real pain for them and a potential reason to give up on the game. So today, even though uh, there is still room for improvement, uh, thanks to all of this, we have come a really long way and we no longer observe players getting stuck in the first hours of gameplay anymore. Uh, and we've been able to start scaling up the game finally and focus on adding events, new features, new content. So I think if there is a lesson that I learned and I would want to share, I think uh, this code uh, sums it up quite well. And it would be that even though your game might seem too complicated, it is possible to turn it into something very usable for a large audience. And there are as many solutions as there are problems. And some, some of them are quick and more simple than you think, like a change of wording and icon. So grasping the root of the problem can be really hard. And sometimes you actually understand what it was after it was solved, which is why playtesting on a regular basis, iterating and using different types of approaches is so important. So that is it for today. Uh, thank you very much for giving me your attention. If you are facing similar challenges, I hope that my talk will be helpful for you. And I will be happy to answer any question. If you want to connect with me, feel free to do so. I can easily be found on uh, LinkedIn with my full name or on Twitter with my username Tissot. Have a nice day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Crux Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner, enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world. Delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal, and play so that you can focus on the game. Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play.
Join our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. I'm here with this wonderful people to talk about how to get into UX games. Um, and here we have Celia Roden, recognized leader in application UX and cognitive science in the gaming industry. Celia holds a PhD in psychology and has over 10 years of experience in game development, UX strategy and process in video game studios. Through work on Ubisoft, LucasArts, and director of UX at Epic Games, the famous Fortnite, she has contributed to many projects across multiple fl platforms, uh, PC, consoles, mobile, mobile, and VR. She is also founder of Game UX Summit. Amazing. You guys should check this out. <laughs> <laughs> Advisor for the GDC uh, UX Summit. Uh, member of the Foresight Committee as CNIL, National Commission of Informat Informatics and Liberty, an independent French uh, administrative uh, regulatory body. That's a lot, Celia. I know, you can just see guys. <laughs> it's fine. This is just me. Hi, everyone. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wrote books, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> Google Celia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tons of things that she already did for this industry, plus books, publish it. Uh, we can talk more about it. Nah, okay. uh, <laughs> Our next here is Filippi Kumaru. Is an experienced designer, uh, experiencing mobile applications and games, focusing on visual, visual design, information architecture, and UX. Currently is working at Cloudhead Games as UX UI designer and a awarding uh, award-winning pistol whip game. Um, that's for VR. It's an incredible game. Check it out too. Previously, he worked in several games and VR platforms, mobile platforms, and Black River Game Studio of Samsung RD Institute. Welcome, Philippe. Thanks, Vivian, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here with you all. Awesome. Uh, Rich, uh, Rich Ridley here with us is a seasoned user researcher with emphasis on entertainment and video technology. Uh, Rich is experienced in broad uh, swatch of methods of applying them on a dig deep, deep into user uh, thought and behavior. He founded a UXR program at EA and is currently leading the game's user uh, research at uh, effort at Oculus. Welcome, Rich. What a profile. Everybody. <laughs> awesome. Oliver, Oliver Donald from UK, spent the four years here in Canada, three of them. Uh, he's been lucky enough to work in the games uh, with this team at RUM HR. He partnered primarily with, but not limited to, creative industries and such as games, VFX, animation to elevate in talented teams, build world-class candidate experience, and mature recruitment and AGR frameworks. Oh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and me. I'm a broad designer uh, with a little bit of 10 years of experience in products, web and mobile, um, but uh, about four to five years already exclusive to UX and apps uh, for games. So currently I'm working at Kabam uh, as a UX designer for Marvel Contest of Champions. Um, and I previously worked at Minecraft for a PlayStation platform. Hello. So we're here to talk about requested topic, which is how to get into game UX. How you do that? I hope that this panel kind of like brings up to the light, to light uh, what you guys uh, have been questing most. Uh, we recently did a uh, poll and to see what you guys have as a question. Uh, so I hope we, we're able to answer all of them. 
So we have actually selected a few to, to talk about it. I'm gonna cover as much as we can. So to start, let's talk about portfolio. What do hiring managers, managers look in a portfolio and how we can make ourselves stand out? Can, Who wants to I can start? kick it off. If you want. Uh, um, uh, from the conversations that I've had with hiring managers um, and not being myself one specifically in UI UX, but um, I think there's a couple of key elements overall for everyone to consider, which not everyone does. Um, and this is going to sound really basic to begin with, but I would say keep it simple <laughs> and show a very clear um, thought process from start to finish of whatever application that you are presenting um whether you know wireframes uh, prototypes all the way through uh, we want to see clear documentation um well written out but not over elaborate um and then when it comes to i think that's just a very basic portfolio representation but then when it, we're talking about going into games specifically um the things that i think that make um make portfolios stand out um, and a bit of advice, I suppose, before doing this is to take a look at the job description that you are applying to. Um, and hopefully with it being well written, you should get an understanding of what are the kind of key elements of what this role is. You know, there may be, it might be some something a bit more specific to research at the beginning of the UX process, whatever that might be. Um, but those priorities should be there at the top. So kind of take a look at those and put those front and center of who you're applying to. Um, the second piece I'd probably say around going specific with portfolios um, and the teams that you are applying to is to shift the topography or the UI on your portfolio to kind of represent um, who you are applying to, like follow similar themes, um, follow similar color patterns, color schemes, um, design, um, kind of make it on brand. So it shows that you are kind of understanding um, how to build what they're building. Um, recently, actually, it's not necessarily UI UX, but it was art. Um, a candidate that I was speaking to um, didn't have this on his portfolio, but he we were working on a RuPaul game. So he drew RuPaul in the style of the studio um, and straight away the, you know, the hiring manager can see that he understands the style. Um, and so he's now happily employed with that team and it's, it's great. So I think that that's a really good point is just understanding and taking the initiative to work in that style. Um, and yeah, the, the other point I would say in terms of like really standing out and kind of going above and beyond Um if you, you haven't worked on a gaming project yet, show that you're you're into games. Um, you know, break down the user experience of a game that you play that either was great or not so great, and do it as kind of like a case study, so that you you are understanding the process from when you log into the game all the way through to what was great, what wasn't great, and maybe offer some kind of tips on what you would do differently or what you liked about it. That would be my somewhat quick and dirty tips <laughs> for portfolio. So anybody else has any thoughts about it? I would just add, so if, if it's for a UX designer position, um, I'll be careful to not just uh, focus on, on visual design because uh, UX design is it's not just that. It's oftentimes not <laughs> that at all. Um, and make sure that you show the process that you, so if you have a case study, um, what's important for me when, when I, I hired a UX designer is to understand why you made certain decisions in terms of, you know, for the experience of the user. So who is your user? It's, it's nice to have at the beginning uh, a summary. Uh, this was the project that was the objective. The, the users were such and such, um, you know, like maybe explaining uh, who the persona is and explain um, your process, you know, as, as concisely as possible so that we understand why you make certain decisions. Um, yes, it's nice to have something visually appealing, especially on your homepage, but ultimately what we care about is, is you know, how you got to um, certain um, decisions. And be careful also if you do case studies for games, if you're not in games, uh, it's a great idea, but be very careful because sometimes it sounds very arrogant. 
um, I've seen, you know, like junior people say, oh yeah, this is, this is crap. And they, sometimes it's using, you know, this is not, it's, this is a terrible experience. So this is I'm not done well. Be careful with that sort of terms because you don't know why um, the team ended up choosing certain things. Sometimes, you know, it's a big constraint. They could not do something else. And sometimes it's a very conscious trade-off that they made um, for, you know, maybe a reason that you don't know about. So you can absolutely do that. I would actually recommend you doing that or just like uh, redo the HUD or redo the system of a game that you know as a case study, but just emphasize that you don't know uh, the constraints of the team, the, the specific challenges and blah, 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 just to make sure that it doesn't sound uh, arrogant. Totally, yeah. Um, and just, just to add to what you were saying there, Celia, in terms of like being able to tell a story with each piece of that I think when you the portfolio is the first end point of entry I suppose for every candidate going through the UI UX process but then when you do start to interview being able to talk about each individual project that you did work on and be able to talk about why you made decisions that you made verbally as well and what you learned from those and um yeah key takeaways and stuff like that so beyond the initial portfolio going through the interview process as well linking back to your portfolio to me i realized that when i was applying for the gaming industry i was not ready and when i received some tips in that after networking i realized that i had to keep on like to make my own branding uh to stand out because then i have a representation that is more accurate to what i am as a designer um and exactly that structuring uh the process uh not forgetting about the why uh if you have projects if you don't have maybe uh game jams like help you out to figure out like how to work in a, in a gaming team and how the process will fit that to that team uh, but always putting some structure on it where like you included the why you include your personas and your uh your focus um uh, and then uh the whole the ux process that you choose to do and why you choose to do that how you think that attends to to the project for vr Philippi, what do you have about the portfolio focus in vr what do you see uh i think uh the basic structure uh to organize a portfolio is considering the game uh, as a product case. Uh, it's important to mention the challenges, methods, and tools that was applied to solve challenges. And, and finally, the results. Um, a plus is instead the numbers uh, of the game after launch. However, all the that stuffs, all the stuffs that are presented needs to be simple and contextualized. All the hiring managers are flooded by links, PDFs, emails, LinkedIn submissions. So the portfolio needs to be clear and cohesive. Um, if you want to talk uh, specifically of, of each step, I consider a good approach is write articles and provide a link to see more info about it. Uh, but the selection, in my opinion, is a bit Hazy, I guess. The knowledge today is at quite levels. Uh, hard skills, uh, I think, are no longer differential because they are already well resolved. There are many um, online courses uh, and information available. So, in my opinion, uh, the soft skills are shining at this moment. Good communication to take uh, UX information to other areas. Uh, education, uh, the team about UX, pra UX practices, ability to lead uh, a facilitation dynamic, internal workshops, stuff like that. Um, in my opinion, it is the differential today. Cool. And you're rich from the UX designers that yeah. you work with. Yeah, research is a little bit different. You don't really have a portfolio per se. Um, it's Usually with most research positions, you're given some kind of activity to do to prove out how you think and the how. Everyone mentioned the how, the why you got to where you were. That's really the important part. The exercise is just a way to understand how you think. Um, and 
if that isn't presented to you, then well, I was going to echo what other people are saying. If you want to get into games, but you've never been in it, you need to demonstrate that you understand games. Um, I see a lot of times researchers that have never worked in games and they don't play games either. And they want to get into games, which is curious to me. Like, why would you want to? <laughs> There's a lot of jobs out there that aren't games. Um, but if you are not, if you want to get into games and you don't play them, I'd rethink it because that's a huge thing that you're going to have to get through is like, we don't understand what we do. And user research is just a little bit different with games. So if you don't understand how that's applied or what the challenges are that designers are facing and games versus productivity software, um, it's going to start you off pretty, pretty low. But if you do know games and you've known an experience, then doing a case study, like you were saying, even like running your roommate through just so you can have one, uh, you know, data point that that works well. I've seen people do that. They run like their husband or their wife through some game that they just want to so they can articulate how they would do something or what it might look like in the future. And that can be really effective and be fun kind of anecdotes too during the, the process. Awesome. Let's move on to let's move to another another question here about portfolio still. Uh, as a plan O average UX designer, what sort of projects do I need to look into adding to my portfolio transitioning to game UX design? I consider it was um, my situation before starting game industry. My first thought was uh, Despite uh, entertainment industry, the game per se still remains a product. So present a solid product vision could be a good approach. However, um, an app or website basically needs to solve a problem. A game is more emotional, introspective, and abstract experience. So. Uh, it might be inter interesting to put some personal projects or studies, for example, a, a usability evaluation, uh, keep in mind the particularities of a game or study to improve the interaction uh, of an interface of a consolidated game, or even try to develop some personal project focusing on experience, whatever. What it means, it's important to show some repertory in games. For example, when I decided to move for game industry in 2014, I started this journey in a university in a specialization course in game development. So the plan was grab knowledge, do network, and put some efforts in most of my class projects to use it as portfolio. Fortunately, it worked for me. In short, uh, it's important to demonstrate your passion, knowledge of games, uh, no matter how, it's my point of view. Um, I, I think it depends. I think, it, I think it can depend on what studio you're applying to and what type of product they're um, making. Um, I feel like mobile versus web applications are somewhat different um, and have a different user experience. So I, I would... If you're applying to a mobile studio, maybe have some mobile examples. Um, that, that'd be just something that I'd add, just mm -hmm. diversity in portfolio again. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and again, I would uh, try to add some uh, uh, small exercises, like uh, something about the HUD, how we, you would redo stuff or um, your process if you had to, I don't know, create a crafting system in a game. Um, you have to understand the, the different uh, genres of game and the different platforms and what are different challenges depending on the genre and the platform. So if you can have a little bit of everything uh, or at least the, the most successful games currently, uh, that can be helpful and definitely have some mobile examples. Uh, even if you don't target a mobile uh, um, game studio, because oftentimes it's it's something that comes up, uh, or they have to have a mobile version or a companion app. It's it's um, it's always good to have some mobile examples here. So, um, but definitely you need some if you target a mobile studio. Yeah, so that you can tackle different areas too, but applying the same concepts is just the way that you do it. Not that specific platform. Um, Let's move to qualifications. Uh, what are, are there any qualifications or certifications that will help me stand out? I, I can throw something out there. Um, I, um, I think the generic, you know, design degrees and, um, are great, but I think that something that I find that stands out is, um, 
kind of three month intensive boot camps or something like that, just purely because it, you're already getting used to the real rapid pace that can be in the gaming industry and working under pressure. Um, and so I think that it gives you like, if you can get through one of those and um, come out with some amazing pieces of learnings and obviously some great additions to your portfolio, I think that um, that can stand out to me. Um, um, and I do like, a, I, th I, I think it's interesting um, having a design background with a psychology background as well, like understanding user behavior and stuff like that. Um, they'd be kind of two pieces that I find particularly interesting. I totally believe that having a game design degree, it helped me out to focus and uh, line out a little bit better and uh, working with UIUX uh, for games because since that in the team, you need to to handle different areas to make your feature happen or to make that feature happen. You need to work with a multidisciplinary team and having this knowledge uh, of working with different aspects in the game, level design, game designers, uh, live ops, or like, et cetera. You do need to know how to have those conversations and uh, understand the reasons behind. Um, and totally helped it. Uh, having a game design degree for me. How was your game design degree experience, Vivian? Um, my game design degree was four years uh, graduation. Um, it was back in Brazil and try to align exactly uh, the different platforms. So every six months I would deliver a full game from business plan to to the final product in a box with the graphic design in the box uh, yes. for different platforms. So I did I did mobile, I did uh, Unity was the way to go, especially because the market in Brazil is heavily uh, Unity uh, based because we do a lot of mobile games. Now Unreal is very strong, at least like going over this change over the years, I see here that Unreal is stronger in some point. Uh, but we did for all platforms and it was interesting to have the, like the fine tuning for each one of them, uh, and having the, this knowledge of the process and how a business plan, a pitch will work until the, the final product. So it's a really good, uh, it really, uh, talks exactly aligns with what the market is, uh, requiring. And I really appreciate the, having done, uh, the college and like the knowledge that I have nowadays. Yeah, I, I was trying to add something earlier, but I was muted. <laughs> um, so for, for UX, I would expect some knowledge of HCI, more specifically human computer interaction, um, just because we need, you need to explain why you choose certain things and you need you know, to, to explain how the human mind works. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have a, a degree in there, but you need to have an understanding in the vocabulary. Uh, so that I would expect uh, that at the very least on understand what is fits law, being able to explain it and that sort of things. And for research, I don't know what uh, Rich thinks, uh, but I would expect you to have done some research before <laughs> um, because you can easily bias the research. Uh, so I would expect people like will understand the limitation, like the human biases and, and how to conduct a research uh, properly uh, in, in a way that is not going to uh, introduce some biases. I had more specific yeah. knowledge I learned in workshops though. That I did, exactly. And I used to call ergonomy and it was in UX. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in, in university, ergonomy. And uh, uh, it's good, it, it's good to, to hear Vivian's talk because I'm Brazilian and I understand that perspective. So in my point of view, uh, there are mainly free and, and paid courses available and we cannot forget the formal way to grab qualification through university in designing courses, philosophy, or science. However, uh, I consider uh, there are main good events to grab this kind of specific and fresh knowledge. Uh, GURX conference like we are did and Game UX Summit that I have opportunity to participate twice. The first one in Canada and the, and the other one in France, DevCon, Reboot, and GDC, of course. Uh, the knowledge with the, which the, the 
professionals bring to these uh, events is worth a lot. And besides yeah. awesome talks, some of these uh, events has master classes with great professionals. In the Game Wax Summit of 2017, I was in a really impressive master class with Dave Lightbound. And I remember Celia was leading another one at the same time. So I consider this event a good way to grab some qualification. It's my, it's my point of view. It doesn't replace the practice though, but it's a good way to start. Yeah, for, for research, yeah, as Celia said, yeah, some kind of background in HCI is something that um, is pretty basic to come into. But the cool thing about research, and I think most professionals agree that um, research people, good researchers come from all different backgrounds. So there's people that are, you know, had a history degree. I mean, you're going to have some kind of college degree generally, um, you know, so history degree or I was a creative writer. You know, that was my undergrad. And then I went to grad school for a little while. Um, didn't even graduate grad school because it started getting work. And I was like, well, that's why I went to grad school. So, um, and then, you know, 20 years later, I'm where I'm at. And so I learned a lot from grad school and continuing to read and educate myself. But then experience is really everything. So when I hire researchers um, and games and outside of games, I, the experience and doing research, if you have some kind of bad, some kind of background is worth more to me than like a PhD and you have zero experience, I'd rather hire somebody that has a history background or whatever it is, but has done research for five years um, and has some basic understanding. So I think it's just getting out there and doing things. You know, that's so when I look at, like you were looking, I think the original question about like certificates or whatever things can kind of give you an edge. Um, if you want to get into it, any kind of experience at all is really what I look for. If there's internships, I would have told my past self to do a lot of that. So if you're just starting out, just get any kind of internships, get any kind of real world knowledge. And that's invaluable. Depends always how you use your knowledge towards the product that you want to create, like how you can pick up that information and uh, convert to a way that it serves uh, to your purpose. Uh, and I think that's pretty much how, how you stand out in an overall situation, like how you, you provide a unique perspective. Like being Brazilian, having different background. I did psychology too, but I didn't finish the college, but <laughs> it helped uh, align it with game design. But this is my individual experience. It might not be the same for everyone. And yeah. therefore, like there's workshops, there's network. That, that's, there is bugging everyone on Twitter, if you can, uh, to get some uh, resources. You know? Like it's just to be persistent and applying that knowledge that you have in the background towards a purpose. I think it's... Uh, Good way to put. Let's move to skills. Since we were talking, I think it's a good segue. Um, can I move to UX after joining like a company? As an example, I'm in QA, I'm going to move to UX. So what the resources are recommended to someone making the industry transition inside of the same industry? So that's a very interesting point because a lot of people get into QA as a door for the gaming industry it happens a lot <laughs> and how we can apply this knowledge to, to ux yeah so i actually did um work uh with some people in qa and uh, uh to see if they wanted to transition it's it's absolutely possible uh i would recommend you to find a mentor uh to help you out into um so you already have a lot of practice and you understand uh the game industry so that's great uh so now it's more about understanding the the theories uh behind ux so again hci or if it's research you know what's important when you do uh research um why it's it's uh uh, harder for QA testers to uh find problems in the ux ux because you know the game too well so that, that's the sort of thing. So find a mentor that can uh, accompany you. And uh, there's a lot of online courses that can help you uh, have a better understanding of, of the theories behind UX. Um, there are a few books uh, as well. Um, so that, that can help. Out. Yeah, I second everything she said. Yes, for sure. As well. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, if you really want to break through, I've worked with people from QA that are just not going to be good at research for whatever reason, and some that are brilliant. And I don't mean that. I think we all know people that started in QA are executive producers and creative directors now, right? So it's a great place to springboard. But research specifically is kind of, you have to have that base understanding of bias and empathy and a lot of the theories that are out there. And finding a mentor is a great way to do it. And really, I mean... When I started, I was in market research at EA because they didn't have a user research org, like at all. They didn't even, it wasn't even a thing they thought about. Um, and so I kind of had two jobs. I was trying to do user research while I was doing that to kind of get a foot up and learn and kind of do things. So I'd imagine that'd be kind of what it is. You're doing your QA job. And if I worked there, I'd say, yeah, you can help. And I'd teach you some things and you can run some usability tests or something. But you'd have to do that on top of the work you already have. But, you know, yeah. it pays off because over time you could get hired to do that. Awesome. I see yeah. a few friends in, inside of a few studios uh, having the same experience, want to move to a different career. And what they usually go for it, or even recommended by their own studio, is starting to have a conversation with the producer responsible for the uh, for that IP and ask if he can participate on, on those rounds of discussions, meetings um, that is happening uh, with the, not only to UX, but to the field that you want to move from QA or whatever transition you want to make, uh, but be more part of the day-to-day -day, uh, duties and even trying to get more, um, try to get some feature or something to work on and help someone uh, on the feature. It kind of teaches a lot. Second part of skills, do UX design skills transferable? <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely are. <laughs> it's just uh, completely like uh, most UX designers that I hired in my career are from outside the game industry. We don't have enough UX designers in the game industry. That's true. Um, so it's it's the same. It's the same principles. It's just uh, games are the main difference. It's not a tool. Um, so it's not just uh, usability and it's not just about accomplishing goals. Uh, so you have to adjust it's to that. Emotions. But, uh, yeah, flow. emotions, engagement, all these uh, like all these things. things. But it's absolutely <laughs> transferable. And the fun. Don't forget the fun. <laughs> I, yeah. No, I don't like fun measurements. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree with Celia. If you understand uh, the game as experience, uh, for example, th this topic reminded me some colleagues. Uh, I have the opportunity to work with researchers from anthropology and sociology with, with an extremely uh, proficiency in research and human being understanding. Um, the same way, I, I have also worked with colleagues coming from computer science, for example, with a good background um, of technical and product requirements, testers with a, a good experience with documentations and use cases covering. So in the sense, the most important thing, uh, I guess, is have a, a proper mindset. But uh, I noticed uh, some convergence points uh, in, in, in all of these examples, like empathy, presentation skills, and, and public speaking, uh, ability, ability to make sense the data and transfer to the rest of the team or other areas, synthesis, ability to, to create opportunities and, and insights uh, from data and yes, finally, another point is the ability to offer the solution. I mean, understand the, the, the culture of company and the UX maturity and the resources that you have to work with. It's my point of view. It's funny, talking about data, it's something that I realized comparing those markets, like not, not game UX, but uh, web and e-commerce and comparing to gaming, data has to be interpreted really well because we're dealing with emotions and people and it's a very tricky thing to do. So working with researchers helped a lot because we can't kind of like have this uh, alignment with uh, what exactly that means instead of just 
picking up the data crude as it is and just working with it's a very dangerous thing to do <laughs> without actually translating that to the perspective what it was the occasion and being very very careful to work with data <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, let's move to game industry is a very specific one. And I think it's a segue to what we're already talking about, mainstream UX versus game UX. I think we kind of answered before. Uh, both are very, uh, they kind of drink from the same, uh, the same fount. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if it's, I'm saying this correctly. <laughs> But they kind of like navigate the same the same space, dealing with people, and the heuristics are the same. The the, the rules, uh, HCI HCI rules are the same. Um, but the game UX added up uh, the fine tuning with dealing with game design and working on features and how you you're gonna tailor that experience to to a game, making fun and promoting the flow and etc. Um, but what do you guys think? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there all those things you said are right. <laughs> yeah, but I think the thing I think we keep saying these the same kind of thing over and over, which is it, you really need to understand games. You know, like all of your skills will transfer, but you have to understand where where what games are and how they transfer and what the differences are we're looking for. But I mean, yeah, all your skills will transfer. You just yeah. have to know how you're going to make them work, and the questions will be a little bit different. Um, you know, like, for instance, you know, when I worked at YouTube, I never looked at how hard something was, like the challenge of something. And it was like, oh, it's not challenging enough. Like, no one ever said that, right? <laughs> but in games, you say that all the time. Like, oh, it's not challenging oh, yeah. enough. People aren't having fun. Let's make it harder. You know, like, so <laughs> there's little things like that. But and if you don't yeah. play games, you know, it's not going to make sense. And it's not just playing for, it is playing for fun, but also having uh, a, a tuning how to criticize uh, that game and how to, to have the takeaways from that game. Uh, not as a user only, as a player, a user only, but also uh, as as a professional view of that game. Yeah, no, not opinions, analysis. Exactly. <laughs> the ideas guy, don't be that. <laughs> uh, the next question for gaming industry, and we're about to finish. Uh, what is the essential arguments for how to persuade people to invest in UX when speaking to organizations with a low level of UX maturity? I think all of us been there. No. <laughs> Even Oliver, no work is like with teams. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's freaking hard. <laughs> But how to explain that to them, like our eyes, like how do yeah. you propose that to a company? Well, I'm working on building a second user research department now, doing it at Oculus. And basically it's the same thing I did. It is the same don't thing I did. Don't yeah. stop, please don't stop. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I kind of have this philosophy um, about doing it. And it's, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Big Night. It's this movie that was in like the, I don't know, around 2000, Stanley Tucci and Tony Shalhoub. Uh, and, and Ian Holm, and it's about these Italian uh, brothers in New York in the 50s, and they're trying to create this restaurant, but they want to serve people, Americans, they want to serve Americans, like authentic Italian food, but Americans aren't ready for that yet. And Ian Holm is this other Italian guy, but it's a very successful Italian restaurant, but it's more of a mix, right? And so they ask him, how is he so successful? And he says, well, because uh, first you have to give people what they want, and then you can give them what you want. And that's kind of like what my kind of, modus operandi about how I set these up and how I work within an org that is immature or doesn't see the value in user research um, is starting with what they want. And what they want is uh, usability, right? That's what they want. They don't understand the breadth that can be offered from user research. Um, so they want usability first. They're probably called a focus test, like who cares? Um, but they're gonna, that's what they want. And when you, they start to see that they don't have to give you a lot to get a lot back, the value that they're gonna get, the impact that it's gonna have on their game, um, and just walking through the process, making them a partner, because they might be exposed to you, like market research, um, which only comes towards the end, and it's more of a focus group. It's really not going to change. It's not going to be that helpful for them. Um, so once you start doing that and showing along, you're giving them what they want, and they see the impact. They want to have more. They want to have more of it, and you start to give them more of what you want that we want. You know that they should be asking for too, which is things in the very beginning, uh, longitudinals. Um, a basic understanding of heuristics across the board, all kinds of stuff that you can offer them. And they start to go, oh, wow, this is great. 
And before long, they can't live without it. Um, and then part of that is um, it's just one person to start. It's always just me. And then they say, we have to have this. How can we get more? Well, I need more people. And then the organization just kind of grows from there. And with the organization and the trust that you build, um, it becomes part of the culture. It takes a long time. That's, but it's give them what they want, and then you can give them what you want. To, for them to put forth the effort to do it for the value Absolutely. they get. It's it's just something that like, oh, well, this should definitely be part of our process. Why wasn't it before, right? So. Mm-hmm. B- building trust is uh, like something where you're uh, saying, Rich, is really, really important. Uh, yeah. I mean, they don't know they did, they don't know. For for us, you know, we're like, yeah, we should have a UX process, a UX culture, let's go for it. People are like, come on, what are you doing over there? <laughs> uh, but they don't know any of that. So the, the idea is, is to really build that up and start with a, uh, you know, uh, uh, quick wins. And, and so then more people are going to be excited about that. And, and then you can s- start to grow, uh, just like in games and, you know, you start, you start to, to show, uh, you tease them and then a lot of people are going to get excited and then say, yeah, but now we need more resources. We need to hire more UX designers. We need to have a bigger lab and have more researchers. And this is how you can get there. Um, but it's, it takes a long time. If you look at the UX maturity scale uh, that are out there, um, it takes years. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Rich and Celia. The late and competitiveness, uh, the industry is billing numbers and the expressed numbers of game is released year after year. Um, this directly impacts the number of players, retention, strategies, decision, engagement, and um, above all, revenue. And the industry impressive numbers are a reflection of how competitive uh, and challenging this industry is, uh, both for AAAs and, and indie studios. In other words, UX aims to, to minimize these uncertainties to launch a, a competitive product. It could, it could be a, a a good point to start a pitch for management team of your company. By the way, I suggest watch a talk of Celia and Heather in GDC 2016. It offered me a good point of view how to do that. And it probably could help you to yeah, I agree with everything. I, 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 my, my simple argument for user experience would just be if it's the experience as a player, how long are you going to stick around for? Um, and investing and building that trust as a UX designer with the team uh, and forging that alliance, as they say, is, uh, is, is so important. So yeah, I, that would be my basic argument. <laughs> Crappy experience, no players. <laughs> and we didn't even start to talk about accessibility games, but. That helps. <laughs> kind of, it's part of the conversation. Um, the last question that I have here, one more about the gaming industry that is very, very um, like important that is happening all the time. What is the challenges that they're happening in the gaming industry right now? Uh, and how maybe navigate those challenges? Uh, so if, if you're from a marginalized uh, community, you have more challenges than if you're not. <laughs> so I, you probably don't want to get there. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just saying. So if you're from a marginalized community, find uh, mentors. Uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, people that can help out, who want to help out. There's a lot of communities. Uh, so go find them. Um, you, you can find there's some resources on my website, but also on ethicalgames.org um, to help uh, with diversity because we're bad right now at this. Uh, so just be be aware of that. Uh, but find mentors; they are out there. Yes, I 100% agree with that. Like uh, I remember Oliver, I bugged you like in the beginning. You recruiter, you just approached me for a UX a Y role. And I remember not having, not being there and asking for feedback and bugging you until I have feedback. I think persistency is something that, uh, yeah. that we need to have. Yeah, it helps. <laughs> but I think, yeah, we, we built a report really quickly, which was great. Yes. Uh, and I think that's, that's harder for minority and being uh, new to a new country. I had to restart. It was something that ha- uh, happened, but somehow things that happened in my life, it helped me to build this knowledge and 
be able to, but never, never like avoid it to be doing networking, to be bugging people on, online, to find people to talk and how this happens here, uh, North America. And then if you're in Europe, in Europe, like uh, whatever place you are, uh, kind of get to know the gist of industry, the culture, try to get in uh, those circles. Uh, it, it helps minority too, because then you're going to be visible um, because it is a challenge. <laughs> it is a challenge. You think it's getting better? I think there is. A I mean, we're, we're starting from so far behind that yes, it's getting better, but come on. <laughs> it's just slow. Well. Uh, yeah, there's some initiatives that are trying to catch up, uh, making uh, people getting uh, into the gaming industry, at least offering workshops focused on or uh, providing highlights for those uh, professionals. Uh, but it's still like far away from from a good standard point because inside of the industry, this inside of the companies, this needs to change, and you do see a few like diversity and inclusion um, departments uh, starting. But I don't think it's enough because there's still bias. There's still a lot of things to to overcome. That is in the end is harder if you don't have sometimes if you don't have a referral, uh, if you don't do the networking, if you don't know those circles, it's it gets complicated. Yeah, it's it's a small industry. Uh, it's big. Also that. It's big that but is, small. Yeah. So it is there's a lot of you have to get into the circles, that's for sure. Networking is gonna be really important. Um, and it's a fast fast paced industry, it can be exhausting. So that that's that would be I would say the the main uh, challenges. So not not good diversity, um, small circles. You have to find your way in and fast paced. Yeah, another challenge is also that like there's a lot of uh, uh, people working. Uh, over time and that's just a practice and we kind of like, oh, we do because we love and you end up trapped it on that kind of thought and not a good behavior, not a good mental health act initiative from your part, but you kind of like you need to, you, you feel pressure to go and just do it. So it's a cultural thing, I realized. I didn't have that before and uh, seeing here how the industry works, but I'm lucky enough to be part of companies that never did this to us, so I'm okay, but I see close enough uh, here at home, someone else working <laughs> over time, and it's just like insane, it's like 12 hours a day, uh, it is a lot, uh, and I don't quite I don't quite know how to pinpoint if it's just a culture issue or if it's just bad planning. <laughs> Being completely honest. Uh, Mostly yeah. bad planning over school. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Viv, can I, can I add two more uh, yeah. challenges on this? Uh, Go for it. The, the first one that I, that I noticed is the gap between the scientific knowledge and the industry production and how to how to translate this knowledge in a simple way to developers how to how can i say how to uh, minimize this gap between theory and practice uh, and the second challenge that i noticed is the how to reconcile the the requirements of of a game with the expectations, aspirations, motivations, and and behavior of players and stakeholders who may or may not be influenced by the, the, the trends and chains that are happening and, and do it in a considerable time to face off other simultaneous launch. Yeah, it's tough, I guess. <laughs> so it's my point of view. That's why, like, people don't stay that long in the industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, I don't have a magical answer for uh, I wish to know how to fix things, because, but doing that, those initiatives, like calling out people to be part of the industry, I think it's a good uh, point of start. If you're interested, if you love that, if you really see yourself doing that for life, uh, 
people with different backgrounds perform better and diversity is a requirement even to change the smaller things or the old outdated practices. I think we need to start to, to push for those changes, but together. It starts small, like, like Rich did. <laughs> yeah. And also, I, I've found in my career, it was really nice to leave and come back again. Um, so, like, I would, just because you want to be in games, if you're there for a while and you're starting to burn out, just, you can come back. There's no reason you can't. And actually, you might probably come back stronger. You know, if you go somewhere else and work on whatever it might be, learn from different people outside of the discipline, come back to games again, you're going to bring in, uh, perspectives that maybe that they haven't thought about before because you got out. Um, so you can kind of do that. Also gives you a little bit of uh, <clears throat> perspective about a lot of things, <laughs> about the industry, about working hours, about pay. <laughs> so oh. going from EA to Google was very uh, quite eye-opening. Uh, I think uh, that's it for our panel. Uh, I just, Thank you, sorry, everyone. Vivian, I just wanted oh, to, to add, yes. uh, I wrote a, um, a blog post last year to oh. uh, give some tips for people to get into the game industry, especially for UX roles. So if you want, I mean, it's a big uh, blog post and there's a, a lot of stuff that's already be, been said here, but if you want to take a look at it, it's on my website, yes. so celiahooded.com and you'll see it's on my blog. It's one of the most recent posts. Yes, let's do this. Uh, get in contact with Celia too on Twitter, right, Celia? Uh, Rich, what's your Twitter handle? Rich Ridland. Yes, look for Rich. <laughs> Find him. You're very funny on Twitter. Uh, Felipe, what is your Twitter handle? Felipe Kumaru. Easy. <laughs> it's my Twitter. His name. Good usability. I like that. <laughs> Oliver, uh, you're not on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, so search for his name. You're going to find him. I'm, I'm Ortenzi, underline Ortenzi on Twitter, so feel free to to look for us uh, and ask questions after this panel. Uh, and I hope that we could bring to light some very good uh, answers for those questions. I hope you guys made it in the end. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Come on in. We need more people. <laughs> yes. That's right. Agreed. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Player Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.
All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch. Hello everyone, my name is Morgan Baker and I'm an accessibility lead and game designer for The Odd Gentleman. And I'm going to do a very quick crash course, what is deaf accessibility? Let's just dive right in. What is deafness? It can range from mild to moderate to severe to profound. Hearing bias leads us to assume that all deaf people cannot hear, but deafness is indeed a spectrum like most disabilities, and therefore it has a range. Deafness is made up of many variables, including pitch, whether it be high like a bird's chirp or low like a dog's bark, and loudness, such as the difference between a person quietly whispering and an airplane's engines roaring. Between the variance in audiograms, along with the vastness of personal experiences, there is no such thing as one single deaf and hard of hearing experience. Everyone is going to be a little bit different. For example, some people may use an assistive medical device, some may be oral, others use sign language, or a mixture of them all. We all access technology, society, and the hearing world a little differently. Should you ever be involving a deaf player, consultant, or developer in your process, be sure to connect with them to see what communication method works best for them. Be prepared to be flexible and allow them to decide what accessibility would be best for them in your process. What is deaf accessibility then? Well, deaf accessibility is a concept of designing with deaf and hard of hearing people in mind, or DHH people. Deaf accessibility is a little more narrow than hearing accessibility, which incorporates cognitive and neurodiverse experiences, and that's a talk for another day. Today, we are specifically talking about DHH players. Unsurprisingly, the functional limitations for DHH players typically lie in the auditory aspect of game design and user experience. And there's also this added effect that though DHH players may have a sense for sound, they do not experience what I call hearing biased. For example, I'm constantly surprised that water makes a sound and that the sound is inconsistent between water sources. So what do we do to make games accessible to DHH players then with all this in mind? Deaf accessibility typically comes in three forms with a bonus, subtitles and closed captions, visual cues with UX UI, alternative communication, and our bonus haptics. Let's discuss the former first. We are all more or less familiar with subtitles and closed captions, and it's critical for DHH experiences. I've listed some basic tips here, including making sure all dialogue is subtitled, label speakers and their location, Keep text to 40 characters per line with two lines per display. Keep text in a static location and make sure text contrasts well using proper font letterboxing and mixed case. Most importantly, let players customize subtitles and closed captions, please. We all have individual needs and therefore customization is the key to deaf and hard of hearing success. This is also why it's crucial to have deaf gamers involved in your research and design process, if possible, of course. Doing so will allow you to optimize the design and user experience to best serve DHH gamers of all experiences, abilities, and backgrounds. Moving on to visual cues in UX UI, 
all pertinent audio should have corresponding visuals. We can do this using UX UI HUD magic, uh, depending on the game you are making. For example, we have an arrow pointing to the direction with a text description explosion to our right. Players particularly like iconology over excessive text, so instead of having a text grenade or explosion with an arrow, we can also use an icon of a grenade with directionality. We can also make it a core part of our UX UI, it just depends on what you're making, but bake in the accessibility. And don't forget that hearing bias does exist. To many of us who don't experience sound every day, there will be some things that don't necessarily make sense or are not really intuitive. I've had games where I've had no idea that the dev meant by loot tinkering or something like that. There's a lot of examples. What may be intuitive to hearing developers may not always be intuitive to deaf and hard of hearing players. Hence why it's important to test specifically with DHH players and consult with experts in deaf accessibility early and often. Let's move on to alternative communication. Hearing bias will make us assume that all deaf and hard of hearing players cannot speak, but as we've learned, that may not always be true. Therefore, we want to offer alternative communication methods, especially in multiplayer games. This can include a ping system, text chat, speech to text transcriptions, and so on. And it's always best to bake this speech accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing players as much as possible. Our bonus is haptics, the idea of using rumble to indicate audio cues or other pertinent gameplay information. Haptics are just great, as DHH players can utilize the sense of touch to better access gameplay. However, haptics are currently supplemental as they're not really available in all forms of gaming and technology can be limiting, even with advanced hardware like a haptic vest, which can cost more than an actual console, software is not always in depth or available to a wider range of devs. I keep haptics as more of a bonus than a core accessible option at this time, but who knows what the future holds. If you do include haptics, make sure to include multiple options such as a slider controller, the strength, or uh, haptic presets. That has been your quick rundown of deaf and hard of hearing accessibility. Additional resources include Microsoft Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, GamesAccessibilityGuidelines.com, and my website, which goes into more depth, LahiBaker.com. If you have questions, feel free to connect with me. My email is momoxmia at gmail.com. My Twitter handle is at momoxmia. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Leahy Baker or my website, leahybaker.com. Thank you so much and take care. Hello, I'm Ian. I am an accessibility specialist with a background in UX and design before that. And I am here to talk to you about two words, about difficulty and about accessibility. 
So if you spend much time in accessibility discourse on social media, or even just general gamer discourse, you've um, probably seen this crop up. People saying things like, this game was designed with a specific difficulty in mind. I'm fine with accessibility options, but not difficulty options. Accessibility and difficulty are different things, and I hate when people try to conflate them. So maybe some of these sound familiar to you. Um, if not, you should feel grateful. But anyway, that's what I'm here to talk about. Those two words, difficulty and accessibility. Um, are they conflated? Should they be? And what is the relationship between them? I'm going to start with one core truth. Difficulty doesn't exist in games. Games don't have difficulty. Um, that concept is not valid. What games actually have is barriers. And difficulty, on the other hand, is something that springs into existence when people play the game. It's something that players experience as a product of their personal capabilities versus the barriers that a game presents. This is why if you and I play the same game, one of us will find it easier than the other, because the level of difficulty experienced is relative to the person playing and humans are a pretty varied bunch. So that's a little bit about difficulty. What about accessibility? Well, first we need to look at what disability is. Uh, disability is one of the few things in life that there's actually global consensus on. It's defined as part of the UNCRPD, which is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which nearly every country on earth is signed up to. And that's based on the social model of disability, which states that disability and impairment are two different things. An impairment is something that somebody has an attribute and disability is a state rather than an attribute. And people are disabled by mismatched interactions between their impairment and some kind of barrier, resulting in difficulty performing a task. Accessibility means avoiding that mismatch. So difficulty is the product of capability versus barrier. Disability is the product of mismatched interaction between capability and barrier. And accessibility means avoiding unnecessary mismatch between capability and barrier. This means that all accessibility options affect difficulty. For example, if you remove colorblindness accessibility, what you're left with is a disabling barrier that makes the game more difficult for colorblind people. And the reverse is true as well. All difficulty options affect accessibility. They modify barriers and any barrier is going to be disabling for someone with some kind of impairment. So while difficulty and accessibility don't mean exactly the same thing, they are intimately related. There's no dividing line with accessibility over here and difficulty over there. Changing one changes the other. And balance is what it comes down to. Games can't be balanced. That's another concept that really isn't valid. They can be balanced to an individual, but they can't just be balanced in general for everyone. Most barriers are actually unnecessary and many are unintended. And some of these barriers can be avoided by default and that should always be the first port of call, but some can't because there's still that variance in needs and capabilities to account for. Humans cover a rich spectrum of variance. So being able to adjust barriers in line with that human variance means that players have some means of addressing the ways in which the game is uniquely unbalanced for them. And that's especially the case if a developer has a particular level of difficulty in mind, a particular level of challenge, because what's difficult for one person is easy for another and impossible for another. So options let more people have the kind of experience the developer intended. What really matters is the kind of experience that we want our players to have and whether any given barrier either enables or gets in the way of players having that intended experience. 
And a game's set of barriers is not the intended experience. It's just a means to an end. It's a framework that we design to try to engender an emotional experience. And accessibility exists to enable that vision, to improve that framework, to ensure as much of our target audience as possible actually have the kind of experience we imagine them having. Thanks. Hi, my name is Izan, and I will tell you a story about how Bloody and Arcade Cabinet taught me about game UX design. Usually, when we're thinking about the Arcade Cabinet, we're thinking about this kind of form, like a big furniture uh, with the screen, and also control, and also some lights here, and also some coins uh, inside to, to ensure the duration of play become more longer. And when I'm thinking about the Arcade Game in Indonesia, it's, it's really struggling to find it, but actually, I found some interesting starting point. Uh, that I can start. Uh, for example, Indonesia is common to have select places for rental where obviously they rent some PlayStation for the public and all players can use it to play it. And actually, why I taking this topic to become an uh, interesting point? Because uh, even though they have some really similar features, like for example, they have some board control, there's some screen, there's some like uh, coin eventually actually for determined duration of player playing. But can we call it both like arcade cabinets? And that's one of my big question. Also, the second question is to like, what are the, arc, the current second aspect that define an arcade cabinet? In order to know that, in actually in the in the in the cell design as my background as well, there's some framework called product successor. It's more like the arrangement of functional elements of a product into several physical blocks. For example, like this one, like arcade, there are some several physical blocks, like display, speaker, control, and chassis with their uh, 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 functioning, like display for, for, for visualizing, speaker for producing sound, and control panel for game control. And that's all the component that can be, we can say that this is defined in the arcade. But actually, in here, actually, they have some similarity in here uh, with the, this kind of component. There are some display, speaker, and control, but Actually, what makes this difference is actually the surface because previously in this arcade, the surface is more like uh, encasing all the company become one product. And like this one, they not kind of like uh, encasing all the product into one product, but it's more like separated, but still functioning like arcade actually, like, like this one. And then in order to know more about it, so I think it to myself, like, why don't I try to make some build some prototype of arcade and try to exhibit to get more insight and to get feedback from the players. So in this case, I decided to collaborate with some game developer. And also I asked them to install one of his games or their games into, uh, into my arcade cabinet. And I tried to exhibit in, in, in the exhibition like this one. And when I make this exhibition, I found really interesting findings. Like for example, the first one, uh, this arcade format, cabinet, cabinet format, it can be enjoyed by everyone. Like by encasing games into the cabinet form, 
will create some open interaction with players and spectators. And also with this arcade cabinet, we'll be create some no edge status boundary to enjoy the games. In uh, in arcade cabinet version, the game shapes control are more pleasant, appealing, and less intimidating for some users. Like for example, like when uh, making the research, I found like uh, one family, like uh, fathers and two two children, they playing around in this exhibition, and the father usually just standing in the back, just watching the children play. But when he, the father, uh, interacting with his arcade cabinet, they actually he in intrigued to to try to play it. And when I asked why you intrigued to play these games, and he said that, yeah, because uh, the control is really simple and actually makes me less intimidating to try it. And, um, and that's why I'm quite interesting to play and quite uh, curious to how it should be game pass look like. And also the physical form in cabinet able to get player attention. So because the, the, the game is encased and it's like encased with a really is a really big cabinet and actually the simple it is quite unique uh, the form is quite unique for them and actually it makes them to interest to play and play the game itself and actually this can be a really good marketing value for the game developer so in conclusion when you know when you try to design the arcade cabinet there are two things experience that experience that you need to consider that first one the intangible game world like the gaming experience the gameplay experience like more like software gameplay but also an experience that comes from the real physical world this is something that you need to thinking of when designing arcade cabinet like for example you need to thinking about like the how the control looks like how the physical looks like so people uh, will you to try your games in the, in the cabinet and that's all from my uh, my story for sharing and thank you for listening have a good day Hello, my name is Megan, and my talk for Grux this year is on how to design for player persistence. Now in games, we usually want games to be at this ideal level of challenge, where it's not too easy, but not too hard. It's just right in this sweet spot. However, it's really tricky to design for this sweet spot, and it's very easy to design challenges that are frustrating for players and cause them to quit. So how can we avoid this? Well, it comes back to player motivation. Players can be motivated to persist a lot under certain conditions. Now, this is a brief summary of some of what I've discovered in my PhD research. I've drawn heavily on self-determination theory, which you can read up on, but what it says basically in a nutshell is if we satisfy our three needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness, we will be more intrinsically motivated to undertake that activity. And this is what we want to aim for if you want to encourage persistence and perseverance in your players. Autonomy being control and having choice over things, competence, feeling good at doing something, and relatedness, having a connection to other people. The three games I used in my research were very cognitively challenging 
video games, The Witness, Untitled Goose Game, and Boa Is You, but with controls that were quite easy to learn, even for people who don't usually play video games. The three cases I briefly wanted to talk about, and these aren't their real names, are Arthur, Terry, and Daisy. And these three cases uh, I really wanted to dig down into because they had such a wide variety of motivation for playing video games as a hobby. So Terry, when he played the puzzle video games, felt very frustrated. He did not enjoy the experience as he felt the games were controlling and pushing him towards finding one particular solution. Terry was driven uh, by this motivation to have control and choice over his gameplay. So his favorite games are strategy games where he has a lot of control over his actions and how he plays the game. And he's quite happy to persevere in those games and lose, you know, up to half an hour of progress and try again because he feels that any failure and mistakes he makes were his fault and he's happy to go back and learn from them. But in the puzzle games, not so much. Daisy was highly driven by relatedness, so she loved playing games to connect with other people. When we played the puzzle games, she was playing by herself, so she would persist up to a point but then give up quite quickly. However, she described to me that she would persist a lot in really difficult World of Warcraft raids. I asked her what the difference was, and she said it was because she was playing with other people and with friends. So they shared that frustration and they could persist and solve the puzzle together. And also, even if they didn't end up winning or finishing the raid, they still had a fun experience together. Finally, Arthur, who was highly driven by competence, loved the puzzle games. He found overcoming the challenges in the games gave him this euphoric feeling. And so he was motivated to persist through the really difficult challenges, even taking a break from the game and coming back to it a day or two later because solving the challenges made him feel competent and that was a really good motivating feeling for him. Even in describing playing multiplayer games like Overwatch, he describes mostly playing in order to improve his own skills. So some very quick design recommendations to tap into these three strands of motivation. For autonomy, it comes down to offering your players choice where possible. So this could be choice over avatar, choice over customization of features, or even choices over key bindings for your game. And a bonus, this will also improve the accessibility of your game. For relatedness, it comes down to either for narrative games, having players feel a sense of connection to the characters in the game, or for not necessarily narrative games, but other games, um, offering social spaces for players to connect. Now, if your game is single player, you could do something like what Dark Souls have done, where players can leave messages for one another in the game world. So there's still a sense of social connectedness, even though it's a single player game. And finally, for competence, it comes down to really good ordering and sequencing of challenges so that they start easy and become progressively more difficult. So players have a chance to build up their skill set and also helping visualize progress so players can look back and see how far they've come when they're stuck on something very difficult. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch, I have papers you can read and I'm happy to answer any questions. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Crux Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner, enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world, delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal and play so that you can focus on the game.
Hi, my name is Anna Weissmeyer. I'm a researcher on the Xbox Research Accessibility Team. We partner with folks across Xbox to create more accessible products and services. Some of the teams we work with include first and second party studios, platforms and services teams, and the hardware team. Our goal is to use both classic user research methods and also some more creative experimental methods um, to support the accessible design work going on across Xbox. In today's presentation, I will start off with a brief description of how our team approaches accessibility user research. I will then follow that with some examples of how our user research has supported the design of accessibility features and Xbox games. Some of the methods we will cover will include some classic ones such as usability studies and surveys, and others will be adaptations that we've made for our, our accessibility work, including methods that have more community involvement such as community expert reviews, player connects, and inclusive design workshops. To conduct user research, you must, of course, first understand the population that you'll be working with. The most recent reports by the World Health Organization and the World Bank have found that over 1 billion people in the world have some type of disability. That's about 15% of the world's population, or between 1 in 7 and 1 in 8 people. In studies that our team has done with Xbox audiences, we found that about 20 to 30% of players identify as having at least one disability. That's between one in five and one in three gamers that we could be missing by not making our games accessible. Our studies also show that players with disabilities are more engaged with gaming than players without disabilities, and that gaming is more important to them in their lives, especially when it comes to mental health. But players with disabilities are not a monolith. They encompass a really wide range of diverse experiences and it's important to think about how that applies when you're doing user research. Everyone in the world has a range of abilities. It's not a dichotomy. For example, thinking about vision, there's a small group of people who are blind with no vision, but vision is a long spectrum of experiences and very few people have perfect eyesight and very few have no vision at all. In addition, just knowing that someone has a disability doesn't help you understand their lived experience. In our work, we wanted to focus on people's lived experiences so we could get a better idea of what their needs might be and how our products can best meet those needs. To learn about people's experiences from this community, we have done foundational research both through in-depth qualitative work such as interviews, as well as scoping work and audience insights through large-scale surveys. We still have a lot to learn, but knowing our population in this way has helped us to develop our perspectives on how we want to approach user research with and for this community. Our work has reinforced the idea that disabilities are neither binary nor static. It's not a matter of having a disability or not, but of how the world does or does not meet your needs. And there's a diverse spectrum of needs across the disability community. For example, a player in one of our studies described their experience playing games on their TV screen. The quote here says, I'm not blind enough to see need narrator, but I don't have enough sight to see the screen from far away, so I have to sit close. For this player, narrator is not going to be helpful and it's not gonna meet their needs, but potentially something like a magnifier feature might do a better job of meeting their needs. People's abilities also change over time, both over the long term, for example, as a person loses their visual acuity over their lifespan, or in the short term, such as when someone's migraines prevent them from getting out of bed. In order to meet their needs, we need to start to focus on finding out what those needs are. Traditionally, people have used four large categories or groups to talk about disability, vision, mobility, auditory, and cognition. And in product development, teams sometimes come to us with the goal of designing for one of these four groups or communities. But unfortunately, not only are people with disabilities not a homogenous group of people, but they also don't usually fit into single categories. What we find is that most people report having more than one disability. Someone may be deaf or hard of hearing and may also have low vision. To design subtitles for someone who is both deaf and has low vision, 
You would want to take into account their need for visual information to convey the same information provided by any sounds. And you would also want to think about how to present that visual information in a way that they will be able to easily perceive it. There's also often a strong and very well-intentioned desire to figure out the feature that will assist a player with disabilities to play the game as a player without the disability might play it. To do this, teams will want to find out what a person's disability is and then what they are not able to do, and then fix that disability by providing a feature that will allow them to do what they need to to play the game. However, in contrast, we like to approach disability and accessible design from a different perspective of how a product can best meet people's needs through accessible design from the start, without the need for assist to enable players to play the game. We want to make the world or game fit our players rather than asking our players to use features to help them fit the world. We were inspired to adopt our perspective on disability, both from the awesome work of the inclusive design team at Microsoft, who created the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit, which is publicly available online, so I highly recommend you check that out. Um, but also from community sources, such as this statement from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The quote on the slide reads, Disability results from the interaction between persons and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full participation in society. Our take on this perspective is that disability is a mismatch between a person and their environment, rather than something that's endemic to the person themselves. Here's an example of how our perspective changes the way that we think about accessible design. On this slide, there's a screenshot from a hilarious drunk history sketch on YouTube featuring comedian Zach Anner. In the image, there's a set of stairs, and at the bottom, there's a person in a wheelchair. That's Zach Anner and a man in a suit standing next to him. We will sometimes present this image to game teams and ask them what they think the disability in the image might be. Most people will say that it might be the diagnosis of the person in the wheelchair, or maybe the man in the suit has an invisible disability. But most people are surprised when we tell them that what we think of as the disability in the image is the stairs. Think about it. If we lived in a world where all of us used wheelchairs to get around, we wouldn't build any stairs. All our buildings would likely have ramps and lifts or other ways that we could access levels and buildings. This building was designed without consideration for the full range of experiences and needs of the people who might need to access it. Our goal is to design buildings, or games in this case, that anyone can enter or exit, which means that we need to sample from the full range of people who might need or want to do so. And that means including players with a wide range of disabilities and experiences in our research. When it comes to our games and other products, we encourage studios to think about designing their features and experiences with that full range of human experiences in mind from the start. As I mentioned before, another element to consider is that needs and abilities are not static. We tend to think of people as falling into one bucket or another. Either they have sight or they don't, and that's the bucket they stay in. But that's not how it works in the real world. One of the concepts that the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit teaches is to consider how disabilities might be permanent, temporary, or even situational. For example, for mobility. There are plenty of gamers who have lost limbs, but many of us have also been in a sling for several weeks and been unable to use one of our limbs. Or you might be a new parent carrying a baby and can only use one of your limbs. Um, or maybe you're holding a beer or even your groceries, right? So there are many different kinds of situations that might put you in a position of having similar needs. So while the actual number of gamers with limited mobility might be relatively small, the number of people with a particular need grows quite a bit when you think across the spectrum of people with permanent, temporary, or situational conditions that result in similar needs. By considering people's needs first and foremost, we can also avoid the issue of forcing people to claim identities that don't fit them just to get their needs met. Many players who are diagnosed with conditions affecting their lives do not identify as people with disabilities, but they may have similar needs to those who do. This is changing, but especially true of people with invisible disabilities. There is still a lot of stigma against identifying as a person with a disability. And unfortunately, that stigma means that people may not learn about or even consider resources that could greatly improve their quality of life. For example, I don't identify as having an auditory disability, 
but I'm very sound sensitive. This means that I generally rely on subtitles because I tend to listen to media at very low volumes. However, prior to educating myself about accessibility features as part of my job, I would have never thought to look for subtitles in an accessibility menu or to activate something like a preset for players who are deaf or hard of hearing, even though that might actually apply to my condition. Uh, for example, if there were features that provided visual cues for auditory information, I would totally turn those on. And prior to being in the field of accessibility, I wouldn't have known to do that or that they even existed. Across multiple studies, we've seen folks with chronic pain conditions, dyslexia, and post-traumatic stress disorder, all of whom whose experiences improve with the use of features designed for accessibility, but who do not identify themselves as a person with a disability. By focusing on people's needs, you can design more robust features that anyone with a similar need can use. There are tons of examples of accessible design being beneficial for everyone, and this is something that is highlighted in the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit as well. For example, curb cutouts. Those were originally designed for people using wheelchairs, but I've used them for strollers, bikes, or while schlepping a giant wheelie bag around a busy city. Here's a game-specific example, subtitles, a feature that when turned on by default is generally used by a majority of players. And by majority, we mean almost everybody. <laughs> Another one that often gets our product teams is audio controls. These features are used by people with auditory, visual, and cognitive disabilities, which of course also includes people with mobility or physical disabilities, since they too have visual, auditory, and cognitive disabilities. If you're starting to sense a trend here, that's probably because there is one. So how do we apply this approach to user research? Well, first and foremost, we found that recruiting by disability is not usually our best approach and almost never a useful approach on its own. Instead, we recruit by asking people about their needs first. We do this by asking two recruitment questions. One of the questions is about what features people use or rely on when playing games. We came up with a long list of features that people commonly use to improve their experience during gameplay. We then adjust the list based on what research questions we're looking to answer. For example, if we're asking about the usability of subtitles for a game, we recruit people who rely on subtitles during gameplay. If we're interested in people's experiences with features that help them adjust sensitivity, we ask about whether they use features such as dead zone settings or precision assist such as aim assist, or whether they adjust the sensitivity of their controls when playing games. We may also then cross-reference the feature use question with the demographics question, such as a disability question, um, or sometimes other demographics such as race, ethnicity, age, or gender, to ensure that we capture a representative range of experiences in our sample. Intersectionality is key. We try to keep in mind that people do not exist in a vacuum, and even though we are focusing on accessibility research, people's needs can be affected by many different factors, both by their disability identity, but also by their other identities. For example, we sometimes receive requests from studios to test many or gameplay narration with blind players specifically. However, what we explain is that what they really want to know is if people who rely on screen narration will be able to use and enjoy their narration feature. So instead of recruiting players who identify as blind, we recruit by asking people if they rely on screen narration for gameplay. By doing this, we are directly targeting users of this feature rather than making assumptions about who those users might be. If we were only recruiting by disability, we would have to make an assumption about who will use a feature and that assumption may be incorrect or maybe you won't capture the needs of the population who actually end up being the primary users of a feature. Here's another example. Think about a feature like an aim assist. Some folks might think that this feature is primarily for people with mobility disabilities affecting their hands or arms. However, Players with low or no vision may also make use of aim assist features if they are unable to use sounds to aim or if they would rather not rely on sounds. People with cognitive disabilities might use an aim assist to reduce anxiety in combat situations or may use it because they are too overwhelmed by other visual information to accurately aim during gameplay. 
People with auditory disabilities might use aim assist if there are sound dependencies in the game that put them at a disadvantage. One can't assume that all these groups will use the feature in exactly the same way. And testing the feature with just one group would be like only testing your cooking game with women because you think women are more likely to want to play a cooking game. In games user research, we would recruit on people who like playing cooking games, regardless of gender, and not make the assumption of who that might be. It's no different for accessibility. Another thing that is critical to consider is making connections to the community. You can't test with players with disabilities if you don't have a way of getting them access to your games. At Xbox Research, we've made inroads into having participant sourcing through two different channels. Uh, the first one was the one that our team created. It's called the Xbox Research Accessibility Community Feedback Program. Players can sign up for this program by joining through by taking a survey. Um, and once they're joined with this program, they get access to um, emails about opportunities to uh, participate in research uh, for that has an accessibility focus across our games and other products such as platforms and services and hardware. Um, another way that players can participate in our research is through the new X Xbox Accessibility Insider League, which launched this year. Um, the Xbox Accessibility Insider League is also open to anyone who wants to join. Uh, all people need to do is download the Insider Hub app on either their console or their PC, um, and they will get access to flights that are specific to um, specifically looking for accessibility feedback from the community. These two channels have allowed us to bring in people from all over the world, especially now in this remote world, um, where we can do things virtually um, much more seamlessly than we were able to pre-pandemic. Um, and because of this, we're able to get you know, community expert reviews with folks from across the world, including like Portugal and the UK and Germany, and of course the US. Um, and with the Insider League, we're able to flight uh, game experiences and get a sense for how the community um, is going to be able to make use of those. All right, up until this point, I've really focused on explaining how our team approaches accessibility, how we think about disability, and how that affects our recruitment strategies and the way we approach our research questions and testing. Now I'd like to give you a little bit of some brief descriptions of case studies of where user research has supported our game studios in some of their accessibility feature designs. The first example I'm going to cover today is Grounded. Grounded studio team, Obsidian, worked really hard with research to develop something called arachnophobia safe mode. In arachnophobia safe mode, there's a slider scale located in the game's options menu that allows players to change the look and sounds of the spiders in the game. The gameplay and the difficulty remain unchanged um, regardless of where you place the slider. There are options for things like removing the spider visuals altogether, uh, reducing the legs of the spiders uh, to just four legs rather than eight, uh, removing all spider legs as you see here, um, removing the spider mesh so that it's just simple shapes, um, and changing the spider materials to simple colors with shiny textures. Um, the numbers of eyes, legs, fur, and even the sounds of the games can be adjusted. Um, and one of the things, uh, the, one of the reasons that Obsidian did this is because they were really concerned about players who experience arachnophobia um, being unable to play the game. They noticed at launch that there were players who were like, oh, that's a really fun jump scare. And then there were other players who were like, oh, wow, yeah, no, I'm not going to be able to play that if those are in there. To develop this feature, the Obsidian team had to figure out what would be the most impactful features for players to be able to control for them to be able to play their game. And at first, they weren't really sure what that might be. So they partnered really closely with our Xbox research team. And Derek Flores, who is a game designer, has a quote in a GameSpot article, which is here on the slide. We worked with the research team to figure out what would trigger those fearful reactions. So the user research team, Deanne Adams and Blake Pellman, 
actually built various spider models, some with less eyes, some with less legs, some with hair, some without hair, and thought about all the features that might be spider-like features that might make a person uh, with arachnophobia uh, be fearful of the game. And they showed people in an in-person study, uh, much like a usability study prior to the pandemic taking place. They would show people images and get a sense for what were the features that were really impacting people's perceptions of the shapes as being spiders rather than being floating circular shapes as you see here. Once they got a sense for which were the most impactful features, they were, they were able to conduct multiple online surveys worldwide once the lockdowns began during the pandemic. And through these surveys, they were able to scope out which of these features needed to be customized um, to be able to keep people safe during gameplay. One of the things that they had to take care in, con in conducting this research was actually that they had to care for their participants. Remember that the participants they're testing with are people who rely on a feature to remove spiders from their game. So they don't want to expose their participants to their phobia triggers in a way that would be harmful to them. So one of the things they did is they devised a way of giving participants control of when the images would be revealed to them so that an image would never be revealed to them if they weren't ready. And of course, they could always quit at any point in time. And this combination of methods actually eventually led Obsidian to solidify the types of sliders available in the demo of Grounded that was released back in mid-June. So here's an example of how classic user research methods, usability and surveys, were used to test an accessibility feature, arachnophobia safe mode, and support the design team in creating a feature that was both usable and impactful for players playing their game. While classic user research methods like usability, interviews, focus groups, surveys are all really great ways to support game design teams in creating new accessibility features for their players or in designing accessible games from the start, we found that flexibility in our methodology is really helpful in terms of helping our studios get a better sense of what those lived experiences are for players with disabilities. One of the ways we've done this is by figuring out methods where we can put studio teams in direct contact with players with disabilities so that they can deep dive during their feature development. One of those methods is called Player Connects. In Player Connects, we connect between two to three players with disabilities with game development teams to have targeted, facilitated conversations. Um, the user researcher is generally the facilitator or moderator um, and helps to keep the conversation on track um, and take notes for the, the development team so that they can refer to them afterwards. Um, these conversations are great ways for development teams to get a really deep sense of what uh, specific experiences might be like. Um, so for example, um, learning about how to communicate in ASL and what the lived experience is of trying to watch media um, with picture-in-picture -picture ASL or maybe when that's not present as well. Um, another thing, uh, topic that we've covered in Player Connects is things about like how to navigate in game environments using only sound um, and what kinds of sounds people are looking for, um, what's missing generally in their experiences, things like that. Um, another method we use is called our community expert reviews or expert reviews. Um, in these reviews, we invite two to three of our most engaged players and advocates with disabilities to partner with two to three researchers to review early design concepts and ideas. Um, in this way, the studio is able to get very early design feedback, like literally sometimes as early as, hey, we just had an idea. What do you guys think? Is this on track? There's no prototype. There's no wireframe. We don't even have a, like a sketch of what this might look like. Um, all the way to you know full game menu and UI for review. Um, that's a prototype that we're able to kind of click through and 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 play around with and see how it actually interacts. Um, you know, the, one of the best things that I love about this methodology um, is first of all that we have community members right there. So rather than speaking for them, we're amplifying their voices. Um, and another thing is just how flexible this is and what a great and fast turnaround it provides so that we can get really quality, um, really rich, deep information for our teams um, in a fast and iterative way throughout uh, feature development. Another one of the methods that we've come up with is called inclusive design workshops. 
These are 15 hour workshops in which design teams get to talk directly to players. Um, they actually interview four players with disabilities that are usually advocates from the community uh, so that they can speak to a breadth of experiences from the community. The studio members who do the interviews then take the insights that they learn from those interviews with players into game uh, design through facilitated ideation and prioritization sessions. Uh, now I'm going to go uh, into a little bit more detail about each of these methods and share some examples of game accessibility features that were a direct result of using these methods with our game studio teams. The first example I'm going to cover here is the Gears 5 navigation ping in escape mode. In Gears 5, um, the escape mode, there is an audio ping that allows players to orient themselves and navigate through the different um, maps and, and areas. Um, the design for this feature actually kicked off with some conversations with a consultant, one that some of you may know, named Sightless Combat. Um, and the uh, coalition, uh, the makers of Gears 5, um, worked very closely with Sightless Combat to try to figure out what were the kinds of audio um, cues that he was missing in order to play through this level. Um, but they didn't stop there. They also followed up with community members through our expert review um, and customer connect. Um, they actually had players play through the feature. Um, so they actually played through the game without the feature, and then they played through the game with the feature turned on while the development team members were watching. And afterwards, we did a facilitated conversation with the players about their experiences using um, the feature um, and also with the feature turned off. Um, and the community feedback had immediate impact on feature development. So here we see, you know, this uh, designing for one and then extended for many um, kind of inclusive design principle at work. Um, the biggest uh, impact that that community feedback had was actually that in the first iteration of the feature, um, it was only active when the player had TACCOM on. This meant that for someone needing persistent assistance, so needing that ping feature on constantly, they had to be spamming the TACCOM button pretty much constantly. Um, and this was definitely unnecessary. And it had some negative consequences. So you can't run while the TACCOM is turned on. Uh, so players who were trying to um, turn it on so that they could access the, the feature actually weren't able to run at the same time. So the team was actually able to add an option for the feature to be turned always on, um, in addition to having the option to only have it on during TACCOM. Um, so, and then beyond that, they, asked, they started thinking about, well, what are other ways we can customize this feature? Um, and they actually ended up having four different options for how this ping feature can function. Um, for players within the game. Um, and then finally, they actually took uh, all of this development work and they also flighted it to um, the Xbox Accessibility Insiders League to get additional community feedback um, and then continue improving upon the feature. Um, so they really combined a lot of the different methods that I've talked about here, um, all ways in which they could engage the community directly and get that feedback straight from uh, community members who are interested in using this feature directly. So one of the last methods I'm going to talk about today are these inclusive design workshops, probably one of the most in-depth methods that we use in terms of education with the Xbox Game Studio teams. Um, it's a structured way to immerse our development teams in the framework of inclusive design and accessible design using our own expertise and the infrastructure of Xbox research. Um, on the face of it, it's to you know, help them develop ideas to make their games more accessible so they love this idea. Um, but under the surface, it's also a culture change mechanism. It's a way to teach teams how to think about their game through an accessible design lens. Um, and think about it from the perspective of players with disabilities and what that might mean. 
Um, the traditional structure for this workshop is two full workshop days, um, but with uh, the necessity of having to do these remotely and virtually, uh, we've actually been able to be a lot more flexible for studios who may not have people who can actually spend um, two consecutive whole days. We have exploded versions that are across four mornings over one to two weeks. Um, we can often tailor the uh, exact format and structure to the studio's uh, needs and their availability. So first off, let me describe a little bit about who attends these workshops. Um, of course, we invite the dev team. Um, and by the development team, we actually mean that we encourage studios uh, to bring people from lots of different disciplines at the studio to attend the workshops. Um, you know, for the smaller studios, pretty much everybody can attend. Um, but for some of our larger studios, we encourage um, a mix of you know, designers, developers, producers, audio engineers, artists, etc. Um, we find that studios can benefit a lot from having a wide array of members attend, both because they get to share um, in seeing each other's perspectives and how, that, how accessibility um, and accessible design in particular affects each one of them. Um, but it also means that when they get back to the studio, they're able to champion and evangelize accessibility um, in a much wider network. Um, we also like to invite leads from the studio, we find that it really helps to push that culture change. Uh, we've received feedback and observed ourselves that the teams that do have leadership attend and do have them really active in the process are gonna be more successful in continuing on their accessible design journey after the inclusive design workshop. We, of course, invite some advisors. Um, so we've created relationships with 30 to 40 game accessibility advocates with diverse backgrounds from all over the world um, who partner with us in our inclusive design workshops. Um, the advisors are usually advocates um, and games journalists, bloggers, reviewers, streamers, um, or otherwise have experience playing and evaluating games from an industry perspective. Um, and this really helps us because they're able to talk about accessibility in games, both from their own personal experiences, because they're all players with disabilities themselves, but also from a much broader perspective in terms of how it impacts others um, in uh, the gaming and disability community. And last but not least, we do have a set of facilitators to help with all of the interviews. Um, so interviewing is a skill. And so to support our teams, so even though the, the dev teams are actually the ones asking the questions with the players, uh, with our advisors, um, researchers with experience in accessibility and interviewing um, are there to support the people attending the workshop um, in creating interview guides, in interviewing the advisors directly, and sometimes needing to, you know, moderate uh, the conversation itself and kind of nudge them back uh, in the direction um, of the questions that they were interested in getting answered. Um, and of course, for the rest of the sessions, when they're doing design ideation and prioritization, the facilitators are there to help them synthesize their insights across those interviews. So you might be wondering, what exactly do development teams do during inclusive design workshops? Well, first off, we need to give our development teams the basic skills and guidelines on how to conduct interviews with people with disabilities. So we do a really short introduction to what some of those basic skills and guidelines are, and then we split up the participants into small groups so they can sit with their facilitators and plan for their interviews. The facilitators will help them organize and structure their conversation to make sure that they're hitting the kinds of questions that they might be interested in. For example, if a team is building a multiplayer experience, they might want to focus on the advisor's multiplayer experiences, such as who they game with, um, what have been the most impactful solutions, what might have been the most major blockers for them. Once they're done planning and organizing with their facilitator, they start the interviews. They move through four different interviews, each with one advisor. Each interview is approximately 45 to 50 minutes long. During the interviews, the team members have semi-structured conversations with the advisors, covering more generic topics like gaming habits, likes, dislikes, um, what does a daily gaming session look like for the advisor, as well as their planned interview questions. After the, individual, after the interviews, they're given time to individually reflect on what they've learned through the interviews and write down their individual insights on now virtual sticky notes. This is in preparation for the next day of activities. 
The next day starts with an analysis of those individual insights that they wrote down after their interviews. During the analysis, we group the team's insights into themes on a virtual whiteboard, and pretty soon we start to see a story of what the studio learned together. After the analysis session, people split back up into their groups for ideation. The idea here is for them to take the insights and themes that we identified in the analysis session and apply those to accessibility ideas for their game. We encourage teams not to worry about resources or funding, but to think about what ideas they would want to design based on what they've learned through their interviews with the advisors. Finally, the groups all share their ideas to each other, and we end the workshop with a discussion about prioritization and accessibility planning for the development team. You might be wondering how much a single team can learn and ideate from just for interviews. It's a lot. Here's an example of a portion of wall covered in sticky notes from just one analysis session with a single development team. Teams have dozens of ideas that come out of these workshops, and we've received really positive feedback about how much these workshops help to not only drive new accessibility feature design and development, but also how much it helps teams to start shifting their culture around accessibility. Here's an example of a feature that came directly from an inclusive design workshop. State of Decay 2 is a zombie survival horror game. The team wanted to add more difficulty levels to make their game accessible to more players. They decided to make a lighter, easier difficulty mode but they had learned through the inclusive design workshop that calling it easy sometimes feels denigrating to players. So instead, they decided to call it the green zone. They also created a live stream and video spot that clearly explained how the difficulty level was different from the others and what changed, because they learned that from the inclusive design workshop too. Here's another example of a feature that came directly from an inclusive design workshop. Sea of Thieves from Rare Studio is a multiplayer game where players team up as pirates, navigating boats and finding or sometimes stealing treasure. The team learned about players' needs to reduce buttonholds, especially in multiplayer games, when it's harder for them to take breaks or pause to alleviate pain, alleviate pain during gaming sessions. Sea of Thieves also makes use of the notoriously inaccessible mechanic, the radio menu which the development team also learned about during the inclusive design workshop. During ideation and discussion, the team realized that they could actually alleviate those issues sooner rather than later. And now I'm happy to share that they not only have multiple options to reduce buttonholes throughout the gameplay, but they also have a set, set a new industry standard for radial menus. There's no holding necessary. And they've also included single stick gameplay. In recent accessibility studies that we've conducted, players have spontaneously commented that they've returned to the game Sea of Thieves explicitly because of its new accessibility features. Our goal with inclusive design workshops is to catch development teams early in the development process to enable them to design with accessibility in mind from the start or bake it in. Borrowing this example from the awesome Morgan Baker, accessibility lead at The Odd Gentleman, if someone asked you to make blueberry muffins and you gave them a muffin with blueberries on top, they might think, okay, well, at least there's blueberries, but that's not really a blueberry muffin. The blueberries need to be part of the muffins or baked in from the start. I like this metaphor as well because you can extend it to the fact that the inclusion of the blueberries might mean that the batter and baking times might need to change. You can't just make a regular muffin and shove blueberries in and expect it all to come out well. It's the same with accessible design. It needs to be baked into the design in the first place. And designing accessible products means that the product won't necessarily look or function in the same way as other similar products. Adding accessibility features in at the end of product development means that yes, those features are there and that is great, but it's not accessible design from the start. Here's an example of a design team that baked in colorblind design from the start. They weren't an Xbox studio at that time, but I still think it's a great example of accessible design. When Obsidian made The Outer Worlds, they wanted to create a world that was accessible to people with colorblindness. 
This was in part because members of their team are colorblind. The traditional way to do this is to add colorblind filters that people with colorblindness can turn on if they need it. And having those filters available is definitely a step in the right direction. But it's an implementation that is asking players to adapt to the game world with a fix, rather than creating a game world that is already accessible. And unfortunately, filters do not always provide the best experience. The experiences and needs of people with colorblindness are diverse, even within the same colorblind type. Filters change all or many of the colors on the screen, depending on the type of filter. Sometimes this means that not only do the colors end up looking terrible, but sometimes colors that were fine without the filter are now indistinguishable with the filter. Players are then forced to choose which set of colors they can do without. Obsidian chose to take a different approach. They designed a game that would not need color filters. The Outer Worlds was designed to be playable in grayscale, meaning that no information is indicated by color alone. Josh Sawyer from the Obsidian team wrote, the Outer Worlds does not have a colorblind mode because it was designed to be playable without color information. Color information is redundant with other indicators. This is the kind of accessible design we hope to support and encourage through our many user research touch points with our studios. Finally, I want to end with a quote that has now become one of the slogans or mantras for the disability rights movement. On this slide is the quote, nothing about us without us. Inclusive and accessible design puts people in the center from the very start of the development process. When experiences don't serve people the way they should, people adapt, sometimes in astonishing ways that designers never would have thought of. We encourage all games user research teams to start talking to the developers they work with about how they can start to build accessibility into the development of their game. You don't need any fancy new methods or tools, just the usual set of people-focused user research methods and, you know, a willingness to step into spaces that you may be less comfortable or experienced with and learn from the gaming and disability community. That's the end of my presentation. I hope that it's helped give you an idea either of how you can start to bring accessibility into the user research that you are already engaged in or how to expand upon the accessibility user research you are already conducting. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.
Grox Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner, enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world. Delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal, and play so that you can focus on the game. Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Hello everyone, my name is Morgan Baker and today we will be discussing accessible horror. Everyone is entitled to one good scare for this year's Grux 2021. And if you've already seen this talk, shh, no spoilers, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and let these two lovely ladies introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Velker and I'm an accessibility lead for Xbox Game Studios and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the tropes that we see in horror games that leave people out on having a good scare. Hello everyone, my name is Emiliane Chiasson and I am the accessibility lead for Square Enix West and I am here today to talk to you about the history of accessibility in horror media. And I am Morgan Baker. I'm the accessibility lead and game designer for The Odd uh, Gentleman, and I'm going to be talking about best accessibility practices for the horror genre. Let's just go ahead and dive straight into it. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this part of the talk, which is called The History of Horror Media from Silent Films to Books to Modern Cinema and Games. I am Amé, or Emiliane, and I'm here to tell you all about it. But before we start, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, my slides tend to be a little bit text heavy. Um, that's just to ensure that I respect the allocated time that we each have for our parts. Um, but feel free to read or listen to me if you prefer. And we also will make these slides available after um, the talk. So do not worry if you miss anything. Uh, those slides will be available after the talk. So let's start at the beginning. <laughs> um, there is a variety of different approaches uh, when we want to induce fear, right? So all of these different approaches still have one intent uh, to scare us. We can look at books, for example, you know, like Stephen King or, you know, uh, here we have Tenerife Dew uh, and different you know, horror books that, uh, you know, come in different shapes and form uh, when it comes to their stories and the type of characters that they portray. Um, some of them are made for younger audiences, like Goosebumps, um, or some of them are made for a more older audiences. And um, they all kind of use different approaches, obviously, when it comes to storytelling, but they all use storytelling and efficient writing to induce fear anxiety and make us imagine our own worst nightmares because when it comes to novels for example um contrary to comics for example um we don't have imagery to support what we're reading so everything happens in our heads and that can be very terrifying um tv and cinema also uses the power of storytelling obviously but now we have more layers more added layers we now have images sounds 
and acting performances, which can really, really, really uh, uh, drive, you know, the goal home when it comes to inducing fear in its audiences. We have um, movies that are silent as well, and we're going to get into that just a little bit in, in a little bit. But, um, you know, movies are a very, very powerful way to, uh, you know, create horror content. And we've seen a variety of different uh, uh, types of horror, you know, and types of stories. It can be monsters, gory, uh, psychological thrillers, and different types of horror that will go and tap into that fear of ours in different ways. And again, same thing for video games. Uh, it uses all of the above storytelling images, um, sounds, um, acting performances. In many ways here, it's more voice acting performances. Um, but now there's a, a little bit uh, of a difference and that's the direct interaction that the user can have with uh, your experience. So that adds a whole other level of immersion that the other mediums uh, may not have um, and that can make your experience way scarier. So now, like I said, if we just go back a couple years to now <laughs> what feels like a lifetime ago. Um, we have the era of silent films, uh, which is oftentimes considered the golden era in the cultural history of the, Amer of the American deaf community. Um, the only reason why I'm focusing on that right now is just because, well, we don't have a, a lot of time <laughs> today to cover uh, the entire history of horror media. Um, but um, I did want to touch upon that because it is one of the most obvious um, places that we can point at when it comes to a cultural shift in uh, horror culture. Culture because in the past with uh, silent films, um, we were using intertitles, sometimes called um, title cards, in order to convey um, character dialogue, obviously, and there were no spoken words. And so that made it a, an experience that was quite accessible um, to deaf people because they could go to the cinema and uh, experience a very similar type of experience as any other of the theater goers at the time. Unfortunately, bye bye inter <laughs> titles because uh, when talkies arrived, talkies being uh, sound films, um, these title cards started to become more and more rare, and nowadays we barely see any at all. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sound films, we've grown to love and hate them. And obviously there's been different approaches to try and make those more accessible. But overall speaking, you know, these experiences in themselves are oftentimes not very accessible. Um, and that goes for, uh, you know, movies and games um, alike and any other type of, you know, uh, horror content that does contain um, sounds uh, uh, on the screen, whether it be through dialogue or um, uh, sound effects, uh, ambience, music, uh, etc. Over the years, you know, there's been still different approaches to try and re-embrace um, live dialogue movies. Um, silent movies, movies themselves are extremely rare nowadays, but we have seen movies that have tried to limit dialogue as much as possible. Um, like in Drive, for example, Ryan Gosling speaks a total of 891 words in the movie. Um, and that's not a lot. And so that's interesting to see because, you know, a lot of movies don't necessarily dare to do that because, you know, we've been, we're used to the new tactics, the new practices, but it doesn't mean that you can't explore what the past has done for us. And, you know, the past has built very strong foundation uh, when it comes to horror media. So definitely go check that out uh, if you're doing research about making your own um, horror experience. Um, films like A Quiet Place as well are very light in dialogue um, and also represent um, a deaf actress. Um, and, you know, so there are places that you can look into how to make things differently. Um, so I invite you to do your homework and go and dig into the past of horror media because there is a very, very, very rich uh, database of um, movies, uh, games, uh, books, uh, even theater uh, pieces that you can look into. And I definitely invite you to do that. And we're not going to get into that today per se. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to movies because we're trying to focus on video games but I did want to touch upon it because I think that's very important and also relevant to whenever you're making these stories for your games and casting also your voice actors and also making characters um, in, in, your, in your game is the representation <laughs> that occurs um, in horror films, TV and that's worth 
a whole other talk, honestly, but just very quickly uh, to say, uh, when it comes to representation, obviously there is a big problem in Hollywood and elsewhere <laughs> where, uh, you know, people who are playing uh, disabled characters, for example, are not people who are disabled, you know, in real life. Um, and that is an issue because there is a plethora of disabled talents that are there and available <laughs> to work and they're not being hired because uh, people who are all either already known in Hollywood are being prioritized over them or people who are non-disabled are prioritized just because uh, there is this myth that it can be harder to work with a disabled actor or talent um, or that it's more expensive or you know that it, it's it's it has it has a whole layer of, a, of complexity to making a, a piece of a piece of content um, which is all just BS, pardon, pardon my French, um, but yeah, definitely take the time to, if you're gonna be, you know, making disabled um, characters and try to, you know, have a message of inclusion, uh, when, whether it be disability um, or, you know, sexual orientation or, you know, including people of color, you know, LGBTQ plus community, make sure that you go and talk to these communities before, you know, building a whole story based on, you know, what you assume, you know, uh, uh, these communities go through or how they, you know, live their lives and how they talk and how they express themselves. It's very important and not just have consultants, but also make sure that if you're going to have a disabled character, cast a disabled actor that can really, you know, push that performance to its best, honestly. So this slide will be available afterwards if you want to read it. But yeah, there's a bunch of, you know, horror movies and TV um, that do this, you know, sometimes both right and wrong in the same, you know, piece of horror. Sometimes there's some wins, sometimes there's some losses there and some fails. But ultimately, again, if you do your homework, you will find a plethora of information when it comes to representation um, in uh, horror media. So, uh... Now, that feels a little overwhelming, and you might be left with a couple of different questions, like, so are sound films automatically scarier than silent films? Are video games automatically scarier than movies overall? And are movies automatically scarier than books? Ah, well, no. <laughs> That's the short answer. The long answer is that it's complicated. Um, you know, obviously, you can create fear in so many ways. Uh, sometimes it's the unknown that induces fear. Sometimes it's guts and blood. And sometimes it's, you know, a scary monster. Sometimes it's jump scares and creepy music. Or, you know, sometimes it's like a creepy voice, for example. And... <laughs> Sweet. It's back. Okay, my bad. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and sometimes it's a still image of a long, empty, dark hallway that will haunt us. So that may all sound scary, no pun intended, but making a scary horror experience, you know, even though it can feel complex, and, and it is like in, like making any other type of, you know, uh, media, whether it be a movie or a video game, it is so worth it. Uh, horror is one of the most impactful, lasting, and powerful subgenre of entertainment, and it has also one of the most active and loyal community, hashtag horror fam, in pop culture. It is the subject of so many studies on culture, psychology, and media. We often love it when it's bad, even, so don't be afraid to dare, because worst case, you can become a meme. <laughs> I'm sure that many of you can hear that, that quote in your head. So here are some quick takeaways, um, you know, from this part of the talk. So regardless of the media, not one piece of horror does it the same. The, har the, ar the art, my apologies, of scaring someone comes in many different forms, and it's been forever evolving over the course of history. That being said, um, terror knows no era nor bounds, so definitely don't hesitate to go dig back way back and kind of like use all the information you know throughout history to um you know do your research when you're creating a, a piece of horror content because there this is it's so rich and it's so important um scaring people is not easy and you know we acknowledge that um but it is also one of the richest opportunity to try different approaches because you know uh this is where accessibility comes into play and it is one of the perfect mindset towards innovation and standing out as a creator so don't fall into tired tropes 
dare to try and make a, a piece of you know accessible horror um, content really and you you won't regret it so right before we leave I just wanted to say thank you for um, it okay um, I'll be I'll be right back um, Tara if you can just you know if you can just uh, cut that I'll just restart the ending at the end okay weird um anyway I, I guess i'll continue with my section so now we've learned a little bit about the history of sort of the horror genre in general i'm going to talk specifically about some of the inaccessible tropes that we see time and time again in horror games and i want to be clear here i'm going to pick these games apart because I love them dearly. I know what these tropes are because I play horror games all the time. And the reason that I'm doing this, the reason that we're having this talk is because we love the genre and we want to be able to bring it to more people. And I cannot stress, I love horror games. That's why we're doing this. But horror games aren't perfect. They make mistakes. Let's set the scene here. You're walking down a, down a dark, dark hallway, and then suddenly you hear behind you a telephone. It's ringing. You turn around slowly. You walk forward and you pick it up, and a story advances. What game is that from? Well, actually, that's from, like, a million different horror games. And to provide some specific examples, it's you in Resident Evil Village. It's you in PT. It's you in The Medium. It's you in literally so many horror games. I could probably make just a talk on horror video games that feature phones ringing that don't have any visual indicators. It's a big problem in horror. And honestly, sound-based cues in general are a big deal in horror games. And they're frequently informing players where they need to go next to advance the story. But we're really seeing the same things over and over that aren't really being captured in any way. Obviously, and I'm not, I'm going to keep stressing this, the first being, being ringing telephones. But the other circumstances, and one I see all the time, are doors locking or unlocking frequently behind you. Think about it. You're in a game, you solve some intricate puzzle, and then somewhere behind you, a door has unlocked, a cabinet has opened, something. But there's only an audio cue. And if you don't see it, then don't hear it and you don't see it, you don't know that it's happened. But there's also frequently things that are supposed to draw your attention to some place that you don't know about. A loud crash or bang. Again, that you're supposed to hear and then follow to advance the story. But if you're hard of hearing or deaf, you may not know about it. But really, I mean, we can go beyond, beyond just story advancing sound cues to talk about sounds in general. I mean, while we're on the topic, mood setting is obviously a huge part, but there's more than just that. A lot of horror games specifically have proximity monitors about how close you are to baddies, and they're using audio for it. You can think back to the first Silent Hill game. The radio would go off when you were near baddies. Radio. What's going on with that radio? But even in modern games like Dead by Daylight, you hear the heartbeat when you're close to the killer. But if you can't hear that heartbeat, 
But honestly, there are so many warnings, sometimes literal audio warnings about things that are happening, like maybe you're on a space station and losing oxygen for decompression that people don't have any information on. You know, and the number of times there's something around the corner or around the door or through that hallway that you're getting ready to go through that as a hearing person, I know there's something scary right over there. But, you know, it's not frequently shown in an accessible manner, which sucks. But one of my favorite things about horror game is the world building. They have such rich lore, feeling, atmosphere, and that's what draws so many people in. And I think that's why in horror games you see so many things that provide more information, from audio logs, to diaries, to medical journals, to occasionally the message scrawls in blood on the wall. But those are also frequently inaccessible. They can be really, really hard to read. And it sucks when that happens because if you can't read the blood on the wall that says cut off their limbs, you may not immediately know how to kill those aliens in dead space. Sometimes they're clues to puzzles, sometimes they're information on the characters, but when they are put in these low contrast environments with these weird fonts in a way that you can't quite get a good look at, people can really lose out. They just can't read what it says, which again, they're amazing in terms of the world building, so it sucks when people get left out. And I want to say that the worst example, um, but what I love is whenever you're doing any sort of gothic horror that has a diary with beautiful cursive handwriting, that, I mean, honestly, even a lot of kids today never learned cursive. It just sucks that they can't get into that. But you know what sucks more? Insta-death. One of the things that horror games are great at are giving you this panic, and that's the experience you're signing up for. But sometimes that panic can really end up setting you up for failure, and you'll have to retry things. So a lot of horror games have QTEs, quick time events, where you very quickly have to make a split-second decision. And if you mess up, well then you're dead. And depending on the game, it can mean you've lost a massive chunk of progress and you have to replay. Or for games that you make wrong choices in, especially if you have to read, it gets compounded. So let's say that perhaps you have a prompt on screen that you're reading and you have to respond quickly. Well, if you're dyslexic, you may have messed that up and now you've made the wrong choice and now you're dead. That was it, really quickly, before you even had time to process what was happening. And of course, one of the things that we love about horror games are the big baddies. And the biggest baddies, oh, you gotta be careful. Because if they get you, you're dead. But you know what sucks? Replaying that same fight over and over because you just really suck at dodging that massive hammer he's throwing at your head. Or maybe it's a chainsaw to your neck. Either way, it's progress lost. And you have to do it again. And when you repeat it, it loses its fun. And one of the things that again, are all about atmosphere and world building in horror games are these visuals, which are frequently full of fog and darkness and extreme shadows. And they are beautiful, but it can make the environment harder to navigate. It can make it so that you miss key elements. Or in terms of having things that you can interact with, you may literally not be able to locate those items because they're blending into the world and they don't have contrast. There's nothing worse than circling the same room six times because you missed that little prompt that said that you were supposed to pick up this necklace that goes in this jewelry box. Again, beautiful, they set the scene, but if you can't play it, does it really matter how beautiful and creepy your fog is? Probably not because if I have to keep walking around in it, it'll eventually lose its luster anyway. And all of these things really do come together in what can be a massive sensory overload for players. First off, you're scared when you're playing horror games. That's on purpose, that's the challenge. But I think we all know that everything gets harder when you're scared. And it's something that was difficult is now more difficult. And on top of the anxiety that you're experiencing, you're probably having flashing lights 
enemies, you're managing your weapons, your ammo, and sometimes the UI even gets more complex as you're playing the game or you're reducing your field of vision because you've been hurt. And that really can overload players. It's something that happens all the time in horror games, unfortunately. And really, the last thing is uh, not even a trope we're going to address here today, but, you know, don't even get me started on the representation- <laughs> Oh, well, that's weird. Huh. I- I'm gonna go see what's setting off my Sam. Hold on. Hello? Hello? Wait, did y'all hear something? Anyway, now we've learned a bunch about the genre of horror as well as how horror games can be inaccessible, so what do we do about it? And don't worry witches, I got you. What do we do first about insta-death? Well, we can limit or even remove it. QTEs, make them optional in your settings. If someone picks the wrong choice, oh, let them try again without any sort of major repercussions. Dying to the same boss over and over again because it's ridiculously difficult, just let players change the difficulty, or better yet, bypass. Losing progress too often, put in frequent checkpoints and let players manually save. Let's take the dark pictures. The game offers holdable QTEs and no-fail options, making the gameplay more accessible to a wider range of players. Streamer Paige Artemis Harvey brings light to this feature with the quote, With holdable QTEs and no-fail options, you've made this disabled horror lover so, so happy. If <laughs> you're ready for no more button mashing, I'd just love to see that. And speaking of button mashing, Dead, for Day or Dead by Daylight, I cannot say it. Uh, recently added a button mashing replacement, one of the most highly requested features within this game. Rather than mashing buttons to escape, players can now do a simple skill check, which becomes kind of progressively harder every single time. The developer notes in the quote, the goal isn't to make struggling harder or make you get sacrificed faster, it's just to make it easier on your fingers, and players were thrilled by the options. And though this game was released in 2016, this feature was added in April of 2021, proving that it is never too late to add accessibility to your game, even in the horror genre. Shifting over, we can add more modes within the game options menu itself. Yes, we can let players like adjust the difficulty, uh, but we can also go a little bit deeper than that. For example, we can add modes to reduce sudden scares or assist modes or apply filters such as a profanity, nudity, or gore filter. The game Trenches actually offers a no jump scare mode, seen in the title menu as the second option circled on the sides. <laughs> How cool is that? You can also take the game Soma, like S-O-M-A. On the left, the game mode is set to normal, where monsters are dangerous and can kill you, but on the right, you can change the game to safe, which still makes the game super creepy. The monsters are very terrifying looking, but they can't kill you anymore. And it's really nice because the game is very much narrative driven, so you can still play the game if stealth is a barrier for you. As Tara mentioned, it's also pretty common to see horror games without subtitles or closed captions, or rather, proper ones, that is. Captions and subtitles should be short and to the point and display at the right time. I cannot tell you how many moments where, like, it's completely ruined for me because the caption comes up before the actual sound happens. Like someone wants to do a surprise stabby stabby, well if the caption happens before it, it kind of takes the fun out of it. They should also have the captions be appropriate, meaning captions should only include pertinent gameplay, which yes, this does include atmosphere and caption audio cues, such as please caption the telephones, I'm deaf, I don't know if the phone is ringing, so please caption it, help, help a girl out. And most importantly, give players the options to customize the captions, which is extremely important, especially for the horror genre. 
As designers, though, rather than subtitling everything, we can also use visuals to our advantage. Because, let's be honest, sometimes sound is just a mess, y'all. This can come in a number of forms, whether it's like UI UX, HUD, all the way to messing with the environment, such as like lighting and moving objects. For example, going back to the phone, uh, sure, yes, please caption it please. But if the timing is supposed to be sudden or jarring, you can flicker all the lights except for the one over the phone or just flicker the light over the phone or have the phone shake in front of the player so it's whoa, whoa, a sudden movement that's spooky. It makes the gameplay not only more accessible but also more interesting for those who may not be using audio. And you can still call upon classic horror to make this really good as Ame has previously referenced. However, you still want to make sure that sound is still there. In fact, consistent sound is the key for many players, especially those with vision disabilities or those who require multiple modalities. So please use sound design still, it's very important. But what do we do about sensory overload? Well, we give players the control, let them pause without repercussions, let them adjust the brightness, let them reduce the number of players or enemies, or make them easier, give weapon options and let them change the UI, let them adjust the volume with separate sliders, and the list goes on forever. The idea is though, is letting players essentially customize things can reduce sensory overload in the long run. But you can also too think about it and bake it in as well, making sure that you don't do things, for example, sudden flash that could cause something like a uh, seizure, which is just not good in general for any game. Let's take the game Horror Tales The Wine. Players can change the size of all in-game text with a sire and select between a number of eight different styles ranging from different colors and backgrounds for the actual text. I mean, just look at this text on the screen. It is massive, it is beautiful, it is a masterpiece, and you can make it way bigger than this in the game as well. Tara also brought up creepy writing on the walls that can sometimes be illegible. You don't need to necessarily remove this from your game, but instead you can provide an accessible way to essentially read it. For example, in Resident Evil Village, they do this in two forms. The first, as currently displayed on the screen, is it'll show the text in a legible font right underneath the nose. So you can still read on here, February 2nd, 2021, Rose's half birthday. But the second way they do it as well is players can open up a text box and to essentially read it with ease and efficiency. Here there is a note on a fridge and players are being asked to press A or F to examine it. And if they press F, boom! Now all of a sudden we get a nice little text box with legible writing. Um, it's a list of groceries, which I guess that makes sense to put that on a refrigerator. Other visual barriers include lights, shadows, and colors, and we want to make sure that players can increase the brightness, but also turn off certain effects that might obscure vision, for example, let them turn off fog or rain effects, and let them change the saturation, the gamma, the gain, the contrast. It won't take away from the game. I super pinky swear that this is very helpful for the horror genre. Horror Tales The Wine once again takes it a step further by adding outlines to pertinent gameplay objects to essentially improve visibility. Here we have a close-up of a broken wine bottle uh, with a nice kind of blue highlight outline so you can see it better in the current broad daylight setting. And here we see again it's in a darker space and the wine bottle is far away and in kind of like a creepy dark cellar, uh, but we still have these very thick blue outlines that are glowing so you can spot the object. It's super clear and it contrasts very well. But if a player needs a hint or if they get lost, what do we do? Help them. <laughs> Take Dead Space, for example, which implements something called deck nav. Uh, you basically hit the right analog stick and a blue line appears showing you the location of the next objective. And though the game is mostly linear, you can actually set objectives to have a little bit more control over this. And don't forget, it's never too late to add accessibility. Dead Space is coming out with a remake, actually, and the devs are going out of their way to add way more accessibility and kind of bake it in or add it as options. The creative director actually notes here, 
all those elements of accessibility will definitely be something important for us in terms of opening the dead space experience to a broader set of people that didn't necessarily have the opportunity or could play the game when it came out. Well everyone, there you have it. Don't forget to bake in the accessibility, add options, and most importantly, please caption your telephones. <laughs> Why are the lights flashing? Do you hear anything? Where's this? Where's the captions? Hello. My name is Paul Stockman. And I have a message for you. Make other games accessible. If you don't, someone might come for you. And you won't like that. <laughs> you can find Ame, Morgan, and Tara, or at least what's left of them, on Twitter at The Slasher Chick, Momox Mia, and Lady O'Pair. Special thanks to Paul Stockman, the first cinematic zombie to act of its own free will and D instead. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book, How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch. Hello and welcome to a how-to guide for Muslim representation in video games. My name is Osama Dorias. I'm a Muslim. I'm happily married and a father to three beautiful children. I'm a senior game designer at Warner Brothers Games Montreal, a game design teacher at Dawson College, the co-founder of the Montreal Independent Game Awards, and one of the three Habibis on the Habibis podcast. These are some of the games that I've worked on in my 14 years in the industry. I've shipped mobile, console, PC, VR, and even airplane games. Today I'm going to speak about why Muslim representation is important. I'll also go over uh, a few select misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. And then I'll jump into the meat of the session, the how-to guide. I'm not here to convince you that not all Muslims are bad. I sincerely hope that no one who's watching this believes this. I'm also not here to start shaming people or companies that have misrepresented Muslims. I've worked on games that misrepresented Muslims myself. Sometimes it's very hard not to conform at a workplace. So there's no shaming involved. I'm not even shaming the powers that be that make these calls. Sometimes they just don't know better and that's why we're here after all. So why is this topic so important? To illustrate this, please permit me to start at the very beginning of my story. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. My family left right before the start of the Iraq-Iran war. We traveled the world for years before falling in love and settling in Montreal, Canada when I was five years old. I've been living here ever since, a proud Quebecois and Canadian. I grew up between worlds. I was completely enamored with entertainment, movies, comics, video games. To me, my love of entertainment and the love of my faith held no conflict. There was room in my heart for both. And that's not to say that there's no conflict in my heart early life when it comes to identity. My family ate halal, and as a result, I had hamburger envy. You see, when I was a child, halal hamburger restaurants weren't a thing. Not in Montreal. 
My parents tried their best to give us what we wanted, though. So my mom would make us homemade burgers. But, you know, I couldn't be sure that they were the same as the real ones that I saw on TV. And my dad would take us to McDonald's for fish burgers, but they didn't make commercials about those. When I finally had my first real burger, I felt so underwhelmed. I mean, it tasted fine, but it didn't taste as good as I'd imagined. And of course, the burgers are just a symptom. It was just one of the many ways that I felt like an outsider in the only home I've ever really known. The 80s and 90s were especially difficult because every other action movie that came out unapologetically depicted Muslims as the villains. Despite loving Hollywood movies generally, I was never given the chance to love Indiana Jones or Back to the Future because those movies vilified Muslims, and in so doing, they misrepresented me. It's no coincidence that the X-Men were my favorite comic book superhero team. They were a group of outcasts that were feared and hated by the world that they were trying to protect. My Islam was one of spreading love and understanding, tolerance and peace, not the one portrayed in Hollywood. To me, Muslims were just misunderstood, just like the X-Men. Video games were my safe haven, because early on they rarely ever mentioned Muslims at all. Of course, that changed drastically with the rise in popularity of the first-person shooter. In 2007, I landed my first job in the game industry. Though I worked with wonderful people that I grew to love, those were different times. The language of inclusivity and diversity was still in its infancy. I didn't have the tools or the vocabulary that I, were necessary to explain to others the impact of their words. Uh, I'm talking about like well-meaning comments like you're one of the good Muslims or jokes about me being a closet terrorist. They cut me deeper than I let on. But more about that later. An interesting thing that happens between game designers is that we often exchange stories of when we realized that we wanted to be game designers. Most of them give answers ranging from 3 to 10 years old, pretty much at the age that they were exposed to video games. I was 7 years old when my parents bought me my first console. It was a Sega Master System. However, I only realized that game development was a career option for me at the age of 27, 20 years later. Why is this? My parents wanted my seven siblings and I to become doctors and engineers. Yes, it's a very Arab stereotype. My dad was an engineer himself. Five of my siblings are now engineers. None of us are doctors to my mother's eternal disappointment. And why is this? Other than the promise of prosperity in this life, doctors and engineers bring a tangible value to society. They heal our wounds and build our cities. My parents' generation looked at media with contempt and disdain. It seemed like the media was out to get us, after all. Why would we want to join their ranks? However, I was an avid consumer of movies, comics, and video games. My parents even encouraged these hobbies. From their point of view, they kept me out of trouble. I loved them so much that I would draw my own comics when I was very young. I would make board games out of empty pizza boxes. I was pretty proud of those. They were both the board and the box. I would make levels for my favorite video games. And yet, the thought never crossed my mind that I would, could do this professionally someday. I decided to become a game designer because my friend, Ahmed Saad, became a game designer. Ahmed was Arab like me, brown like me, and Muslim like me. That's... That's what happened. I saw him. It's very simple. Something clicked in my head, and all of a sudden I was able to visualize myself in a career that was the natural ev evolution to the many passions and hobbies that I had throughout my life. Within a year, I had my first job in the industry. I was very fortunate. I worked at a company with 500 employees, and there was only one other Muslim. And as I mentioned before, I heard my fair share of Islam Islamophobic comments early in my career. But I was a junior with no real authority, and as most juniors do, do, I kept my head down. I loved my job, and I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. Studies show that people with Muslim-sounding names are offered a third of the interviews that people with Western-sounding names are offered. They are then offered half as many jobs after the interview process. And honestly, that's not even the worst of what we have to deal with. 
Islamophobia is on the rise. It peaked in the Western world after September 11, 2001. It started to die down, but recently we're seeing a, sh a sharp surge in Islamophobia once again. Incidents tend to happen on the street, but they also take place in mosques and in workplaces and in schools. Most of the victims are women. Most of the perpetrators are men. And 10% of cases are of extreme violence. In 2017, there was a shooting in a mosque in Quebec City, a city not too far from Montreal, from our city, where six people lost their lives while praying. And in 2019, there was a shooting in a mosque in New Zealand that claimed 50 Muslim lives. Studies show that at least 15% of Muslim children hide, hide their faith out of fear of being targeted. I'd wager that many more would hide their faith if they had names or skin complexions that would allow them to do so. Muslims have a public image problem. It's sometimes dangerous to be a Muslim. Good intentions sometimes have bad results. In my life, I've had many people give me the compliment of being one of the good Muslims. I used to thank them and take it in stride because it was it can be quite emotionally taxing to explain microaggressions to someone who isn't familiar with the concept and then follow up with an explanation of why what they said specifically was a microaggression. So the definition of what a microaggression is, for those who don't know, um, it's a commonplace verbal or behavioral indignities, whether intentional or unintentional which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults at the expense of marginalized groups. And this phenomena isn't limited to everyday people, of course. Often, people in powerful positions make these same mistakes. So please bear with me as I read you some of these comments. We need to be cooperating with Muslim nations and with the American Muslim community. They're on the front lines. They can provide information to us that we might not get anywhere else. If we are to succeed in defeating terrorism, we must enlist Muslim communities as much as our strongest allies, rather than push them away through suspicion and hate. Report. Enlist. Front lines. I've been a Muslim all my life. I have never met a terrorist. I wouldn't know where to go to meet one. I'm not on any front lines. Stop militarizing us. This is a tweet from a British Muslim team that went viral. For better or worse, this is the kind of problems that Muslims are dealing with. They're the same problems as non-Muslims would go through. We need you to be our allies, not the other way around. Now I'm going to give you some examples of misrepresentation from movies that you might have seen. The movie The Siege is about a terrorist attack on New York. The perpetrators in the movie are Muslim. So is one of the CIA agents um, looking to bring them to justice. Agent Frank Haddad is shown to be drinking and isn't very religious when he's on screen, which in and of itself won't really be a problem. The issue is the association. Everyone who's a terrorist in the movie was ultra-religious, and everyone who's a good person was a, as Western as possible. The message this sends is that you can be a Muslim, but not too Muslim. Some Muslims practice more than others, and that's okay. In the movie Three Kings, there's a disturbing scene where an Iraqi woman is shot point-blank in the head. I'll spare you the graphic visuals. This is used to paint the American soldiers in the movie in a positive light, to show their cause as being just and noble. Now, it's not all wrong. 97% of the victims of terrorism are Muslim, so it's not a lie. But when you have a movie that only shows Muslims as victims and villains, you're justifying war. We send people to liberate Muslims, and if Muslims' lives end up being collateral, well, that's what we're there for anyway, right? Solely portraying Muslims as victims justifies wars that make us victims. It's very simple. Now, I'd like to take some time to debunk a few misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. 
I could talk for hours about these mis misconceptions, so I've only chosen a few that I believe most people don't, don't know about. Most Muslims live in these countries. I mean, Muslims live all over the world. I live in Canada. But the biggest Muslim populations are in these countries. Fewer than 15% of Muslims are Arab. And by this I mean people whose primary language is Arabic. This number increases slightly if you include people who speak Arabic as a second language. The largest Muslim country is Indonesia. A country we rarely ever hear anything about. And Muslims in India alone number 204 million, and they account for 14% of the population of Muslims. So what does a Muslim look like? Now, before I answer this question, uh, does it conjure up an image in your head? Hold on to that image. It's a normal reaction. Your mind is quickly constructing an image based on memories and depictions of Muslims that you've seen in the past. Now, let me ask you another question. What does a Christian look like? What does an atheist look like? It's much harder to nail down just one look for these two groups because you have a much larger sample base to pick from. You probably imagine someone who looks like this, with varying degrees of dress. It's possible that you remember the Muslim that you know personally as well. And that would be preferable. You might even have conjured up a less stereotypical depiction of a Muslim. But Muslims also look like this. We can and we do often look like you. I'm going to show you a series of people. And please just take a second and think about whether you believe this person is a Muslim or not. Let's see if you could spot a Muslim. This person is Sikh. This person is Hindu. This person is Christian, Syrian Orthodox Christian. This person is Jewish, Ethiopian. And this person is a Buddhist. Now, any one of these people could have been Muslim. They all come from countries with a large number of Muslims. Muslims wear turbans and saris and headscarves as well. It's only in the small details that you can tell from the dress whether it's a Muslim or not. Muslims are diverse, just like everyone else. So now let's get to the meat of the session, the how-to guide. So please keep in mind that the topic has a certain degree of subjectivity. So if you speak to a Muslim and they disagree with a the point, they're also correct. You know, not one person holds the truth for an entire community. These are some Muslim comic book characters from the past. A ragtag assortment of bad jokes and stereotypes. Mostly villains. All poorly designed and shallow and outright insulting. Then we finally had a chance to tell our own story. This is Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, created by a pair of Muslim women, G. Willow Wilson and Sana Amanat. When it launched in early 2014, Wilson and Amanat only planned out the first three issues. They were fully expecting Marvel to cancel it before it got any further. The comic became a huge hit, as well as Marvel's first ongoing series starring a Muslim character. It's been running for over five years now. And Kamala is what happens when we write our own stories. Kamala normalizes the North American Muslim plight by bringing it into the mainstream. The clash of cultures and values and traditions. Our youth really needed this. But Kamala also allowed non-Muslims to have a glimpse into the lives of North American Muslims, demystifying our world and building bridges of understanding. Remember, Muslim children often hide their faith. Our youth didn't want it known that they were Muslim. Now everyone wants to be Kamala. We don't have our video games version of Kamala Khan yet. I mean, we kind of do. Uh, we have Kamala herself in some games, and we're really grateful for that. But we don't have our own Muslim character introduced in a video game that's spreading awareness on a mainstream scale. 
Herein lies opportunity. Who will be the first to reach this growing demographic and make so much positive change? We need you to give us a platform. We need you to amplify our voices. One of the things I think developers worry about is offending their Muslim staff by asking us about details and how the game could represent us. It's more offensive not to ask and do something that misrepresents us. Keep that in mind. So please talk to us. And of course, there's a measure of emotional labor that comes with this. So when you reach out to Muslims, please be aware that um, of that and allow them to like decline. It's possible that they don't want to. And just make that easy for them to say either yes or no. But don't let that stop you from asking initially. And of course, there's a desire for people now to have representation in their games, and that's a good thing. But word of advice, don't stack tokens. And what I mean, what I mean by this is that uh, if you have a game with a lot of different characters, don't make one of them uh, like a paraplegic black Muslim woman is an example that I use, and then have everyone else in your cast just be a white male. I mean, I don't take the wrong message away from this. I'd love to hear the story of a black paraplegic Muslim woman. But don't expect that one character to check off every representation box and then you think your job is done. That's not how representation works. And if you do have such a complex character, then try your best to find someone who, whose reality is as close to that character as possible and hire them as a consultant. And above all, make sure that this isn't your only character that isn't a straight white male. One easy thing developers can insist on is authentic casting. Though I did love Aladdin as a child, I mean, it has a lot of problems, but um, I was willing to take my non-horrible representation any way I could get it, to be honest. The one thing that bothered me the most is that Aladdin didn't really sound like me. I mean, what's worse? In Aladdin, most of the people who had Arabic accents were villains. The heroes all sounded white. Let's take Egyptian sniper Anna Amari in the video game Overwatch as a great example of voice acting done right. Blizzard hired Egyptian actress Aisha Salim to play the part. Not only does it do the character justice, but it also helps her stand out from the rest of the cast in a recognizable way. What's also notable is that they, use, they cast a, an actress who sounded like she could be the character's same age. She, she was age appropriate which in itself stands out in a medium where most characters seem to be in their 20s and 30s. So there are actual gameplay reasons why this is a good idea. Add us to your rosters. So if you have a game with different playable characters, consider having people from Muslim countries. These characters might not even be Muslim and it doesn't really matter. If you represent the religion in the same way you represent the religion of other characters, Example, if you don't mention the religion of other characters, then don't mention the religion of the Muslims. That's enough. I don't know if Super Street Fighter 4's Turkish oil wrestler Hakan is Muslim. And it's still enough just to represent a country that's normally not represented. That happens to be a Muslim country in this case. So just add us in your rosters. And add us as NPCs, non-playable characters. There are some excellent examples of people already doing this. There's Farida Malik from Dusex, who is a badass pilot. Sarah Hasmadi from Tacoma, who is a brilliant scientist. Dr. Farah Murad is a world-renowned engineer. And even when you're swinging in Spider-Man, you'll encounter hijabis who will greet Spider-Man warmly, though they will not hug him. And what's amazing here is when they try, uh, when he tries to hug them and they refuse, Spider-Man respects their choice. It's beautiful. It's representation done right. Running a pizza shop in Good Pizza, Great Pizza, you'll randomly encounter and serve hungry Muslims. And a nice little touch is that the Muslim character never order pepperoni. I thought that was wonderful. So we need you to include us and we need you to normalize us. Our prayers are precise. 
Of course, Muslim characters don't have to be unfailing pillars of virtue to be considered a good representation of their religion. In Morgan Freeman's portrayal of Azim and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, he was an exile, but he was also nuanced. He had honorable character and his own moral code, and he might have been an ideal example of how to do things the right way if Freeman had just prayed properly in the movie. Muslim prayers are very precise, and therefore we develop like we as developers should strive for accuracy when depicting rituals and religious practices in the same, in the games that we create. And if you're worried about doing it justice, it would be completely acceptable to just omit the prayer. Or as always, hire a consultant and make sure you're doing it right. Farah from Overwatch, who I mentioned briefly before, received an alternate skin when she's wearing a traditional where she's wearing a traditional Egyptian Bedouin scarf. This meant the world to Twitter user Jasmine Loves You. She says, I've been waiting all my life for this. And honestly, I've been waiting all my life for this as well. Now, if you look closely at her avatar, you'll see that it's Kamala Khan, naturally. Because, of course. <laughs> Overwatch did a great job representing the Egyptian Bedouin scarf. And given that there are 1.6 billion Muslims around the world, or more, depending on whose count you believe, you will definitely want to do some research. And ideally, even hire a consultant before representing the dress or culture of a specific real-world nation. Depending on the context of the character, the hijab may be a burqa or a niqab or a chador instead. However, all these options are welcome for created characters. So if people don't like that option, they don't have to wear it and that's okay. Don't identify it as something from a specific culture. Like, don't say this is a Somalian headdress, unless you're researching that specifically. But otherwise, have fun with it. I mean, it's an option. Anyone of any gender can wear it. Just put the option there and give people the choice. So, when you see this screenshot, what country do you think this scene takes place in? Most people usually guess Iraq or Syria, but I call it Arabistan. It's a generic Middle Eastern, Southeast Asian war zone rubble place. Somewhere you wouldn't feel bad if a stray bullet hits anyone. It's rubble anyway. People are suffering anyway, so it doesn't matter. What this does is it desensitizes people to our reality. It dehumanizes us. When people watch the news and see a war-torn place, they recognize it as the bombed-out Arabistan that they played in a game that they with their friends, rather than the shocking aftermath of a once-beautiful country, as has been the case with Syria recently. But the Middle East has no shortage of beautiful cities, and these never get any representation. This is my friend Nicholas. He tweeted about Overwatch's map Oasis when it was first revealed a few years ago. It portrayed a future Iraq that was flourishing. He shared this news with his Iraqi Canadian coworker who reacted emotionally. Now, in case it's not clear, I was that coworker. And as I mentioned before, I was born in Iraq. I think about this all the time, but I, I write about this, I speak about this but I never projected a hopeful future for my country of birth. It just, the thought didn't cross my mind. I was hoping for better, but a bright future, it, would, it felt too out of reach. And that someone else would do this in a game and set it in a future and make it, you know, a bright future, it, it brought tears to my eyes at work. That's how important Muslim representation is and positive outlooks are. We need you to humanize us. The gaming industry has been making big strides when it comes to representing marginalized groups of all kinds. All we want is to be included in this conversation so that we may be better understood. And that's it. Thank you very much.
We hope you enjoyed Crux Online. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, our generous event sponsors, our amazing ASL interpreter Deb Taylor, our volunteer event team, and of course, you, our viewers. Videos of the sessions will be available soon on the Groxig YouTube channel, and we can keep the conversation going in our Discord. The next event from our volunteer community is the Games UR Summit in the first half of 2022. For news on that event and more great content, follow at Games UR on Twitter. And for Grox Online attendees, we have an exciting giveaway from Sketch and an extended trial offer from Balsamic. All you have to do is subscribe to our newsletter at the link below. From all the Grox Online team, thank you very much and we hope to see you again next year.